uh, distinguished guests and participants, a very good afternoon. I, Priyanka Mishra, am pleased to uh, welcome each one of you uh, to this brainstorming uh, three-day national seminar on the post-independence Advaita thinkers. Uh, in this post-lunch uh, session, we have pro four great scholars of philosophy to enlighten and enrich the session. Uh, so I welcome you all uh, in this uh, session. Uh, and I would request you to welcome them with a massive round of applause, please. Uh, <laughs> Today we have with us Professor R.C. Pradhan, who is going to preside over this session. Professor Pradhan is a former professor of philosophy at the University of Hyderabad. Professor Pradhan has uh, expertise in the philosophy. No, don't. <laughs> okay. Uh, so now I would request uh, Professor D.K. Mohanta, sir, uh, to come over to the podium and deliver his lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be here just now in post large sessions. Uh, I'm very happy to see all my senior colleagues are here. And I must start with Agyana. The title of the paper is the Agyana Adhyasa. And you know, Pramath Nata Tarkavagishwa, who has worked on this in Bangla. Unfortunately, this uh, books are not translated into other languages, many. So I shall uh, try to derive resources from his Bangla writings. And <clears throat> then Kesi Bhattacharya uh, is well known. And his student, Dr. Rajberi Dars, as I said earlier also, it's rather in our tradition is a very rich tradition, a living tradition, a digital tradition. Excuse me, I am not a committed Adhaitin. But uh, I'm fond of reading these Adhaitas and somehow in a way I'm going to present. But in most of the cases about Kesi Bhattacharya, I would presuppose uh, uh, Daniel's presentations uh, on Kesi Bhattacharya. Uh, the pro since the time is short, the program is long. So <laughs> I shall try to summarize this. As you know, there is a small treatise by Shankara, which is called Brahma Jnana Bali Mala. There is one karika, 21, where it is said, Slokhar dena prabhakshami yaduk tang grantha kutivi brahma sattang jaganamitta jiva brahma ivana paraha idam evat shat shastram iti vedanta dingi. The, there is summarized the Advaita thinking. What is said in the thousands and thousands of verses, I can tell you in a half verse. Brahman is the only reality. The only real is Brahman. And the world of multiplicity is ultimately false. And the uh, identity, there is a complete essential identity between individual self and reality as such. Now, it, then it, there arises a problem about Vajjana. You know, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, you have seen the uh, abstract. So I shall discuss Vajjana according to Advaitins. There are people say, the, if you have to name one epistemic pillar for Advaita, it is the Agyana is Bhavarupa, it is positive. To a Nyayik or a realist, turn realist, it is negative, it is Jnana Bhavo. And here it is, though it is Jnana Virudhi, but it is positive. So uh, I, I would like to clarify this sense. I shall not give much uh, and giving reference to Pramathanasa Tarka Bhasi Bhoshana, Tarapa Bhagisha and Kasi Water Church and uh, RBD or uh, Raspberry Dash. The difference in the approaches seems to lie in two different conceptions of consciousness. It's very important. In two different schools, for the Nyaya philosophy, consciousness is conversely known as Jnana, in, is of the nature of an effect and of a quality. It is called adventitious Adantika Gunaha of the self. For the Advaitins, it is the very essence of the self, the self itself. The, this very difference in attitude 
I feel is the guiding principles in the treatment of ignorance as negative in Nyaya philosophy and positive in Advaita philosophy. It is also bearing in their respective approaches to the problem of error. And there, the paper proposes to justify this claim, which will use English term ignorance and superimpositions as equivalent to Sanskrit term Agyana and Adhasa respectively. I'm not uh, 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 mentioning in details, but Brahman alone is real because most of the things I shall presuppose is a five part of the paper. I shall only read the last part uh, where Kesi Bhattacharya's contributions and there is a quarrel between Kesi Bhattacharya and R. B. Das. So this Sarup Lakshana Adar, then Tatastha Lakshana we discussed in the morning sessions. Then Agyana is called according to his Gyana Bhava. For the other things, it is Gyano Birudi, but not Gyano Bhava. Yeah, then <coughs> the controversy is here. Uh, they said, or Duitin said, there is difference between Sarupa Gyano and Vritti Gyano. When it is called Gyano Birudi, it means it is not Sarupa Gyano, it is the Vritti Gyano, the source of the inference, uh, ignorance. But Gyano is not purely positive like Brahman, so the state of realization of Brahman destroys Gyano though it appears as positive. So if it is a positive, how can it be destroyed? Yes, it can be destroyed. Then in what sense of Jnana is Bhavu Rupa? It is the question. We, can, we cannot categorize Jnana as purely positive like Brahman. Rasbiyari Das has clarified the position. It is positive only in the sense that it is not nothing. Why? If, if it is nothing, the world of multipli multiplicity cannot be created. You know, through big shape of Shakti, there are two Shaktis. One is one, one, one is Avarana Shakti, which covers the oneness of self. Then big shape of Shakti, it projects multiple ways. So big shape of, uh, uh, you know, so unless something is positive, it cannot uh, create this multiplicity. That's why it is positive in this specific sense, not in ordinary sense. Uh, then uh, I discussed, and it is also called Yat Kinchit, something. Now, Gyano is formless. There are debates. I'm not going to this. And also another important concept is Sakshi Chaitanya. There is a metaphor in the uh, Upanishads. One, the body is happy, the tree. Uh, there are two, you know, Pakshi bars one is only seeing another is enjoying the fruits so although it is introduced the shakshi chaitanya to explain the uh, paradox of uh, jnana i am not discussing it here then mimangsha view mimangsha says the yaikas are very peculiar people here i don't know whether sachida professor sachidanda misri is here or not benaras is a place of nayaika and the vedantin so i'm <laughs> very here to tell you that mimangsha has also said no, the Nayaikos can see even if it is not here. So this is the position of the Nayaika by Vishishra, Vishishra, Bhava, Sambandha. If there is no tiger up on the table, even Nayaika would say, yes, I can see it. The, the table is characterized by the absence of tiger. Directly, they don't say anything. They will do, do, do these things. This is the Nayaika position, I understand. And Mimangshakas also say, no absence cannot be perceived it is known through non apprehension anupalabdi there are controversy you know about this i am not going into that only thing is that it is jnana bhava for the yaikas and for other things it is positive it is, although it is jnana virudhi so now debate continues uh, and pramatna turkavagish has given uh, you know very substantial arguments he did just, just uh, justification even for the Nyaya of you and also for the Vedantis, just like a philosopher without taking part to any. If this is presupposed, then it will be the conclusion. If that is presupposed, then that is the con conclusion. It's very interesting. Uh, then Lokas of Ignorance, Shakshi Chaitanya, Ignorance Negating Pramana. Padduiti is also replied this, that uh, uh, knowledge for Padduiti, knowledge to knowledge journey, but the Nayaikas not knowledge to knowledge journey. This is actually the different methodological approaches in two philosophies. Then 
problem arises. How K.C. Bhattacharya understand this? He said, you know, this can be proved by perceptions and inference. I'm also not uh, dealing with this inference. It's a little bit complicated. It will take time. So, Agyano is Anadi, but Shanto, that it can be ended. Now, then Ortadhasu and Gyanadhasu, Oddhasu, yesterday also we discussed it here, so I am not analyzing it anymore. Sankara said, Sriti Rupa Paratra Purva Drishta Abhavashaha. So, it is Sriti Rupa, not Sriti. It is not memory, it is like memory. It's a ma again a metaphor. Agyano causes. Uh, Gyata, Geo, Gyano, divisions. Then what is our task now? What I feel that the task of philosophy is not ended with a commentary of life, but to lead the life in the right direction is another necessary task that philosophy performs. When the light is insufficient or dim, we cannot have clear perceptual cognition of Dekar, and we recognize it not as a piece of Nekar, but as a piece of silver. The same happens in case of our perception of a piece of rope as a snake. Then that propuncho actually exists in Atman. Sometimes we have perceptual cognition of a wooden post as a human being. Now Duitin extends this analogy to the knowledge of this changing world and argues that we have the cognition of prapancha or changeful world in the cell. So, does this prapancha actually exist in the self? This is the question. Self and not the awareness of self. Here, Bhattacharya thinks that the Dvaitin is right when it answers it in the negative. It is called Adhyasa Suparam position. At the basis of this cognition, is the self, and we are not aware of it. This is his analysis. Then he referred to Sankhya philosophy. I also escaped this because Sankhya Rabe has discussed it in details. Because for reading of uh, K.C. Bhattacharji, as I understand his article or his paper on Sankhya, one must read. Um, I'm coming to the fifth person, Maya, he says, as a as the logical pendant of Advaitin's view of Brahman. And Brahman is the undifferentiated self-shining truth. Our reason is incapable of establishing neither Maya nor Brahman. In other words, all our well-known causal means of knowing fail to aid it. They are matters of faith, and we can interpret or contextualize them by thought and not more than this. There is an article, Advaita Vedanta, and it's you know, spiritual significance by K.C. Bhattacharya. Most of my deliberations based on this. Then he quoted <coughs> this Upanishads verse, you know, Upanishad verse number 12, as the one who claims that he knows, in fact, does not know. One who knows that he does not know, is in fact, does not know. What does it imply? Is that what is realized directly as true, it's not a matter to be expressed in a philosophical theory. So he is not in favor of theory making here. It seems to be an indication to mysticism. Uh, I refer to the Shatashtra Upanishads, bar 60 and 61. There are two bars analogy. The body is like a tree, and the two bars have the same locus of existence. But the one is enjoying different fruits of actions. The other is only witnessing the act of the former. The individual self has no strength of knowledge, and so is under suffering. The same individual self, when through practices like meditation, etc., and serving God, realizes his majestic power, then he can transcend the spell of suffering. All our Philosophizing aims at realizing our limitations of describing what is real in communicable language. Maybe it can be felt, but not described. It is very difficult to explain what is meant by Advaita Vedanta by witness consciousness. He refers to Sakshi Chaitanya. I, I'm not explaining it because it will take time. So in while he explaining the uh, illusion, so for imposition, uh, 
he said it, it takes me in two different levels. One is the unobjective subject and the false in so far as it appears as you. And the individual self means the self feeling itself embodied and the illusoriness of the embodiment is the illusoriness of the bodily self and merely the self's identity with it. So illusion occurs in two levels. When we conceive I as you, it is the objective subject. Uh, and where me is the object. So what is an object? What is meant in the subjective freedom? In the second paragraph, it starts with this. The object is that which is meant by the subject. It is, there is no subject object dichotomy. Uh, in Cassie Bhattacharya, Jesus, Rita Vedanta. Here I am rather aware of the body as simply felt. When afterwards I correct myself, it appears that it is my individual illusion. We conceive you as I, here under the spell of illusion, and the body appears to be a distinct and yet anyway I. Though we correct the first case of illusory cognition, we cannot disbelieve it. Question now comes. How is the subject in Kasi Bhattacharya's philosophy understood? The answer, it is understood only as a distinct and not different from the consciousness of it. It is freedom as such. Kasi B titles his paper, the subject is freedom. I am giving some examples. From A is different from B. One can pass on to B is different from A. <clears throat> From A is distinct from B, we cannot pass on to B is distinct from A. Here one can pass on to B is different from A. So he is questioning the realistic position. Realism, whatever it says, has failed to distinguish distinct consciousness from different object. This is Cassidy's view. Now, Cassidy, we can summarize it, what he says. <clears throat> to be conscious of oneself as individual, for me is to be conscious of me, the me as illusory and the subject or I as truth. It is the illusion of the individuality that suggests the theory of objective illusion called Onirivachanya Khyatibad. Let us now see how the classical example of Rajusharpa, rope snake illusion, has been interpreted by Bhattacharya. In the beginning of his essay, Shankara's doctrine of Maya. In such an apparent cognition, there are three stages. The first stage is the state of presentation of snake. We all believe that at that stage, that it is real. The second stage is the state of correction that arises due to our perception of the rope as rope. Still, then, we have the cognition of the snake with the quality of unreality. The very first precept of the snake turns into a state of illusion as soon as we can affirm it as rope. The past perception of the snake has now a subjective status and we consider it as a possible object. The third stage is a stage of contemplation. And here we are aware of the fact that the so-called snake has no existence at present and it had also non-existence even when it appeared to be perceived. So then he talked about uh, givenness. Uh, it is simply a positively unthinkable. We are yet to deny that it has an absolute not. If we analyze the aforesaid three stages of illusory cognition, we see that it appears as implicitly real object, as unreal object, and as indescribable. Finally, we can realize that it is not given at all, and therefore the status of absolute not. These three stages of illusory cognitions are connected to our ways of thought process, such as uncritical thought, critical thought, and faith. This is according to Casey Potter Church. Now, uh, I don't have time. I have tried to criticize the Casey Potter Church's point of view because he has given this right in his writing when he says, no text of philosophy or religion is infallible. You have every right to criticize it. So I wanted to, because of scarcity of time, I, I, can't, I don't want to continue it.
only I, I would say that uh, uh, it is on Irvachanya, uh, there are is the concession of truth is not given, but he said self certified, not self justifying truth. So here I uh, mere non existence of the thing out there. And the existence of the thing in idea cannot be accepted as a sufficient condition for explaining what is commonly understood by the word fact in philosophical discussion. This is my point. Mere non-definability cannot mean unreality of an experienced fact. This is my stand. What characterizes the erroneous cognition then? We are influenced by what in reality is nothing and see things where they are not. So uh, to me, it is not a the Nonirbachanya Khyati Bada is not a satisfactory position because it fails to explain the situation and prepares room for faith. You know, it argues just like a defense lawyer, not like a judge. We want a philosopher should act like a judge, not as a defense lawyer. It is not very satisfactory position to admit the world, as it is given is an effect of our construction. There is no guarantee that there will not be ground for uncertainty and deception in our act of knowing. It is argued that Onirbachaniya snake appears in the intuition as real and is subsequently rechanted as characterized by the hitaratu locative attribute of Bebaharikatta and the Advaitin must equivalence in psychological Annatakhyati. They are criticizing the Nyaya of the Annatakhyati, but they are when they are introducing the notion of Bhikshava Shakti, it is also indirectly recursing, taking place, taking help as a Netakhyati. Perhaps with an intention to hint this Rashbiari Dash in 1925, a very young scholar in Amalnar says, theoretical reasons may not be sufficient to save us from resulting agnosticism and doubt. I am. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm advancing an argument against Anirvachanya Khyati here. According to Advaita, Anirvachanya ignorance is the source of illusion. It has two powers, as I uh, explained earlier also. So a close and discerning reading of the power of projection indicates that it has the function of Annata Khyati. The concept of Bhikshava itself is the unswearing guarantee for ontological Annata Khyati. Now possible positions. Is this in this sense when Advaitin objects to Annatakyati as something which is both logically and psychologically impossible, it badly affects the Advaita theory of error also. The Nyao philosophers claim that our causal instruments of knowing are competent enough to give us truth and they mislead us when they are having some defects. A Nagarjunian Buddhist would see it as an exercise in dogmatism in spite of posing a claim of apparent optimism or faith in dogmatism. A Shankarite Vedantist does not seem to have a preference for silence as such, as we see in Buddha's silence. Anyway, I am not elaborating this point here. Let me reserve that excursion for another occasion. If my brother, Misraji Anand Prasad Anandavis invites me again, I shall have committed to for that excursion. Thank you so much for your patience. So much. I have two general questions if i may the first question is regarding the title the subject is freedom am i free or am i freedom what is the the significance of, of you are free of, to choose but you are not free not to choose my second question has to do with the with your work on uh, kesi Bhattacharya in bangla do you see a continuity between the work in english and the work in bangla especially the bhagavad gita vichara or, or is there a, a, a unique feature to the to the work in uh, Bangla, thank you. Yes, actually, Kesi Bhattacharya expired in 1949. Later part of his life, every day, as as if he was in the university, 
in the morning after breakfast he used to write in the loose papers and put these things scattered things later on his son kalidas bhattacharji got all these papers my my teacher's teacher grand teacher sanath kumar sen uh, he was supposed to type all these things and records sanath kumar sen gave me some of the rare manuscript during lockdown i was also free and i utilized it it does not mean that i am a master on kesi bhattacharji please excuse me but uh, the papers edited by uh, uh, vinath bhattacharya these are the earlier collections in late 50s but apart from this he has written many articles in bangla as well as in english his treatise on hinduism it's a different type of things many the, i i find his bangla writings are more original in a sense but at the same time i'm hearing you his language is so terse in bangla also you cannot just change a word from the here to there uh, and most of the time it is incomplete but you can sense that what he is going to say in the, in the next in my editorial i have guessed such things and are verified by my teacher professor kalyan bakchi who taught me kesi bhattacharji in 1980 and 81 and still today also we discuss but i i'm sure yet i am under i am yet to understand kesi bhattacharya i am a student of kesi bhattacharya in this sense so this is my humble reply <laughs> प्रोफेसर प्रोफेसर डीके मोहंता आपके पेपर में ना मुझे एक इंटरनल कंट्रडिक्शन दिखाई पड़ा वो इंटरनल कंट्रडिक्शन इस तरीके से कि आप अज्ञान को भाव रूप स्टेब्लिश करते हैं नहीं मैं नहीं किया वेदांत वेदांत सिंह ने किया नहीं ये क्या क्या ये निगेटिव है अज्ञान जो है वो भाव रूप है और उसका बहुत सिंपल आर्गूमेंट है कि अज्ञान चूंकि अनादि है लेकिन वो अनंत नहीं है उसका बाद हो सकता है इसलिए उसको हमें भाव रूप ही मानना पड़ेगा लेकिन बाद में जब आप अज्ञान को भाव रूप मान लेते हैं और जब आप अपने पेपर में लास्ट में आप मेटाफिजिकल अन्यथा ख्याति को स्टैब्लिश करने का प्रयास करते हैं तो एक तरह से आप वेदांत के व्यू पॉइंट को क्रिटिसाइज कर रहे हैं उनकी अनिर्वचनीय ख्याति को आप मेटाफिजिकल अन्यथा ख्याति में कन्वर्ट करना चाहते हैं ये दोनों एक साथ नहीं कर सकते आप या तो आप अज्ञान को भाव रूप मत मानिए अगर आप अज्ञान को भाव रूप मान लेते हैं तो व्यवहार दशा में भी आपको मेटाफिजिकल अन्यथा ख्याति मानने का कोई फिलोसफिकल फ्रेमवर्क आपके पास नहीं रह जाता है गलती कहाँ हो रही है कि आप रज्जू और सर्प के उदाहरण को एक्सप्लेन कर रहे हैं लेकिन अद्वैत वेदांत में जब सर्प का बाध होता है निवृत्ति नहीं होती है जो विशेषता है इल्यूजन को एक्सप्लेन करने में जो निवृत्ति और बाध का अंतर करते हैं जिससे घट बुद्धि जो है वह पट बुद्धि से निवृत्त हो जाती है उसी तरीके से इल्यूजन में जो सर्प बुद्धि होती है वह रज्जू बुद्धि से निवृत्त नहीं होती है बल्कि उसका बाध होता है सबलेशन होता है लेकिन सबलेशन के बाद भी जो रज्जू बुद्धि बची है उसका भी तो मिथ्या तो आपको सिद्ध करना पड़ेगा और तब ये एग्जाम्पल आपके लिए सुटेबल नहीं होगा तब आपको फिर श्रीहर्ष के उस पद्धति को अपनाना पड़ेगा कि हम उसका लक्षण नहीं बना सकते तब फॉल्सिटी उसकी प्रूव कर पाएंगे और इस तरह से अंततः आपको अनिर्वचनीय ख्याति ही मानना पड़ेगा मेटाफिजिकल अन्यथा ख्याति के लिए कोई स्कोप नहीं रह जाएगा Any other? Yes, please. संभव ही नहीं है माना ही नहीं गया है ज्ञान सदा अबाधित है ये अगर नहीं नहीं सर्प बुद्धि का बात एकदम स्टेटमेंट यूज किया सर ने कभी भी वहां पे ज्ञान का बाद अद्वैत वेदांत में माना ही नहीं गया है कहीं नहीं कहा गया है ठीक विषय का बाद संभव है ज्ञान का बाद संभव नहीं है लास्ट प्रश्न मेरा है 
So, very good questions. Some of the confusion arises because of lacking of the elaboration of the points in my paper. To first to uh, response to my good friend Professor Ambika Dattar Sharma, who is a metaphysical and in a person you can't see any case but a charge you are here. So, to metaphysical on your bachelor you can't see. If it is there, I am not establishing it. I am only criticizing it from Nyao point of view. If you criticize Nyaikas for this, you are also accepting Bhikshapa Shakti. Bhikshapa Shakti means one thing is presented as other things, or one is presented as many. This is their very strong realistic viewpoints. So, Bhavarika side, you cannot establish, you know, and referring to Jnana Shamanna. Knowledge universal is another point, and Shakshi, all these are in hierarchical order. If you go by this, then there seems to be high room for faith. Then Advaita is not philosophy proper, rather religion. And that is why it is called faith. This is the implications, in fact, significance of Advaita. I am not taking part to with anybody. As an analyst, I am analyzing, extending the traditions. What can be said in its favor, maximum? What can be said against its maximum? This is the exercise. I am not taking part, but I am taking the place just like a judge here. In that way, I think the tradition can be developed. We can exercise the tradition. We have every right to inherit the tradition, but also. We must claim freedom from the tradition. I am claiming freedom from the traditions. In that way, with due honor, I criticized Casey Bhattacharjee's interpretations of error. Uh, any, any, any other? Any other? Uh, last speaker, I could not actually grasp his point. Okay, okay. Thank you. So thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much. So please go for it. Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, such an enlightening lecture. Now I would request uh, Professor P. R. Bhatt, sir, uh, to kindly deliver his lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Pradhan and other scholars in the audience as well as my co-presenters, ladies and gentlemen, this is an attempt, you know, the title I have given, it is not that way so important. The title is the basic structure of Advaita philosophy, some philosophical reflections. Basically, what I have done is uh, taken from Radha Krishna some insights and other insights from other scholars on Advaita. So it is a kind of uh, well, com combining the strength of several thinkers and trying to make room for Advaita as a kind of universal universally acceptable spiritual approach to liberation. That kind of attempt has been made here. And uh, I would uh, first clarify two, three terms, very technical terms, of course. The one is, uh, well, there's a more problem for the Western students Western philosophy students, uh, the term idealism. So, you know, I was told, and even now people do say that, like that, Advaita Vedanta is absolute idealism. 
Now, idealism can be taken in two perspectives. In one perspective, you know, which is thought or concept, you know, that kind of perspective. The other perspective is spirit or the experiencer or self. Perspective from the spiritual dimension. I would like to say that uh, Radha Krishnan talked about idealism in this sense that it is the spiritual that is the core of his, uh, sorry, Advaita philosophy. The second term that is problematic in the sense that it is misunderstood more often than understood, that is the term knowledge. Again, in the context of epistemology, people do talk about sources of knowledge, pramanas, and uh, pratyaksha, nomana, shabda, and so on up to six pramanas are really talked about. Not all schools would accept all these six, but nevertheless, some schools or the other would be talking about these six pramanas. And what is very relevant and very core of the, you know, why you call Advaita or Shankara's Advaita is path of knowledge to the liberation. Now, knowledge here, there is another term which uh, not very frequently used, but nevertheless, some scholars have emphasize that Brahmanubhava, that is a kind of experience. The term experience again will be misleading if I simply say experience because experience is used in the sense object context, protection, and otherwise internal experience if you, if you want to refer to. But Brahmajnana, of course, some scholars claim that Brahmajnana comes from only Sruti. But Shankaracharya admits even, you know, Brahmanubhava as one of the sources. I would like to argue that the real, you know, knowledge of Brahman comes through Brahmanubhava rather than Sruti. Why do I say so? Let me come to that point. Sruti, of course, normally understood as Vedas and Upanishads. And if we translate it in English, we might call it authority. And if we take it as authority or Shabda, in that it is not only Sruti, that is Vedas and Upanishads, also trustworthy, knowledgeable person. Let us say, in the context of medicines and health, doctor may be an authority, or in the context of philosophy like Advaita philosophy, the Jeevan Mukta also will be an authority. So knowledge coming through these authorities are also equally acceptable. Now, the what we have learned through Shruti is Atman is same as Brahman or Brahman, uh, Atman are identical. So this identity is, you know, in my understanding, is heard or read from that text. So in the Western philosophy, we have Russell, for example, who talks about, you know, knowledge by description so somebody else describes, let's say, what a computer is, and I hear his words, understand it, and he explains to me how you can type in that kind of computer, how you can even talk to somebody or communicate with somebody else through internet and so on. I have this verbal knowledge, let us say. So this is not perception, not realization, nothing of this kind is only verbal knowledge. So verbal knowledge, if it is uttered by an authority, 
it should be trustworthy so in that sense through shrutis we get to know that there is something or some level brahman and atman are one and the same now this knowledge doesn't give you more than verbal cognition verbal knowledge and you have not yourself realized anything or experienced anything except cognitively learning that one and the same thing has two words to refer to it one is atman another is brahman so this verbal knowledge according to me is limited only at the cognitive level here say kind of thing but doesn't give any authentic knowledge which brahmanubhava can give you so this is at the verbal level and of course g more also gave in a different context simple notion he talked about yellow is a sim- simple notion he says physicist physicist can give you wave length this that scientifically can explain what is yellow color but what you know is only verbal knowledge again that and real knowledge comes only when you experience yellow patch color so that he would call so the verbal knowledge of wavelength etc doesn't give you the quality of what yellow is you have to experience to understand it he said it in a different context of course but similar idea that knowing something personally through experience could be different from just learning verbally that is the other kind of uh yeah now the question has been raised in the literature in advaita literature whether brahmanubhava is a pramana my simple answer is it cannot be because in all the you know pramanas there are means means of learning something so in fact pramanas themselves can create problem in the phenomenal world that is what is maya we talk about in advaita in advaita you can have misperception like ropsnik example or silver shell example etc so this particular misperception because of defective means or not conducive environment or the distance may be too much so whatever the reasons are we might conclude habitually looking at a certain rope as snake because snake also is longish and rope also is longish and if the adequate light is not there we because maybe psychologically we have the fear of snake grass is around etc so you might be frightened so you might mistake something to be a rope to be a snake and so on this if you closely examine with the proper light everything going closer maybe or maybe conducting some experiments throwing a stone at it whether it moves or whatever so there are ways of finding out so error in perception in the phenomenal world its correction also is using the perception only you are not knowing coming to know that it is not a snake from verbal testimony an authority watchman or somebody who you know is around he need not have to tell you that no 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 that is not a snake it is a pipe or rope or something of that kind you have to experience yourself experience it again and come to the conclusion it is not a snake it is rope similarly any other error in perception or and even if we are talking about error in anumana so that also you have to learn that what is the problem maybe you know uh, hetu is not proper one justified one and so on so you can talk about error so far as it comes to the phenomenal world and so far as you are talking about pramana knowledge that is generated through pramana there can be error and so on 
when you come to the question of brahmano bhava there is no means in between so no chance of error at all it is a direct knowledge either you have it or you don't have it if you have it there is no chance of error at all so in that sense i would say that brahmano bhava has to be kept distinct and unique and you should not ask the question in fact asking the question whether brahmano bhava is a pramana is an indication you have not understood what is brahmano bhava so that very question that debated there is a long debate of course i am not going through all that and uh, therefore this particular raising the question itself is an indication that one has not understood so Brahman, brahmano bhava if that is the kind of uh, you know knowledge certainty if you are having it then you know the theory of error in advaita seem to be a problem again for example anirvachaniyatva uh, anirvachani anirvach uh, anirvachaniya khyati vada so now this is a kind of again a problem as far as i could see so maya while talking about maya maya is sat vyavarika sat that is you know that something you know all of us have that ordinary notion of you know reality see please look at this in advaita like any other thinker has the liberty to use the term real in a certain way that is called in the western kind of philosophy it is called linguistic liberty in india of course we don't talk about it so explicitly every speaker of the language has the right to give operational definition or special definition what he might call the real definition so advaitians had the issue about what to call you know this kind of reality that is vyavarika sat so they said that it is not eventually real because maya if you are a realized person you will not have maya at all so that means what maya disappears but maya is experienced by all the ignorant people so there comes the question you know is it contradictory to say that maya is sat as well as asat who would be saying that maya is asat only those who have realized the brahman those who had brahman ubhava so if they are saying that maya is asat and if we are saying that maya is sat maya cannot be both sat and asat it is a contradiction in logic western logic especially you know when they say tautology is always true under any interpretation and contradiction is always false under any interpretation so following western logic we would have concluded maya is false but in uh, advaita since we are in the vyavarika level so it is sat so who will say that it is asat it will be you know jivan muktas or shankaracharya himself let us say or maybe shruti so therefore there arises the question who is asking this or who is giving this description that maya is indescribable it is the only realized person or vedas upanishads so but ordinary person doesn't know that it is asat at all because if he thinks that it is asat then he cannot think of eating his dinner because dinner is also maya it will vanish so for all practical purposes that's why nayakas would call the this world real whereas advaitins will call this as 
mithya at a certain level. So, therefore, the question who asks, if you ask that question, that question has no locus at all. Those who are Jeevan Muktas need not have to ask this question about Maya, whether it is Sat as well as Asat, because they know it very clearly, it is Asat. So question doesn't arise. So indescribability to Maya need not be ascribed at all by anyone, because the people who look at Maya, it is real for them, therefore it is Sat for them. They don't know the transcendental reality at all. So, Nyaya real is Advaita Vyavara Satya. And Advaita real, nobody knows. And even if you know, you cannot use any language to describe that. So, that is the kind of situation that we land in. So, therefore, this Anir, you know, this so called error about the Maya would not arise at all. It will not be an error at all. So only it will be error, if at all, for Jeevan Mukta, who is also knowing Vyavarika Satya, as well as transcendental reality. They can say it, but then why should they say it if they know that it is going to mislead? So therefore, there is no occasion to even use uh, this kind of terminology, you know, indescribable is not necessary and describable will not harm because just because Maya is describable doesn't mean that you know you will not you cannot get liberation at all. So that Pramana knowledge source of using Pramana and getting liberation that is out of the question given the structure of Advaita philosophy. So then of course there is this path to liberation, Sravana Mananandi Jijasana. Basically, what it is trying to tell you is that you need to, not only you have heard it, now you need to con, you know, clear all your doubts. So here again and again, Manana as, uh, reflect on it, and there will come a time maybe, you know, you are able to have concentration and then Brahmanubhava might take place. So it is like yogic way, concentration is eventually the one which will help you to get uh, have Brahmanubhava. So if we take it this way, if this understanding is quite reasonable, then obviously one can talk about the implication of this Advaita philosophy. If spiritualism is the one that you are talking about, it is the knower or the spirit that achieves the Brahmanubhava and gets liberated and then talks about, you know, the other things for humanity. So what is the ethics? The ethics that in Advaita would be that, you know, even if you accept you know, Purusharthas, that is Artha, Kama, Dharma, Moksha, and so on. And what is the function of all this? Artha, Kama, Moksha, uh, you know, Dharma and Moksha. All of them should be in harmony, you know, for, for the sake of. Kama doesn't mean that be reckless and kill anybody you like and so on. So, mind has to be, this is not only Advaita philosophy, almost all, including even Charvaka, Susikshita Charvaka, that you need to be kind, you need to be duty bound, you need to be earning money in an acceptable manner and enjoy, you know, your life. Maybe happiness is the only goal for Charvakas, maybe. But for others who believe in moksha or liberation, even they will say, if you go through them without psychological Freudian, psychological problem. In other words, Buddha had said, don't desire at all. If you desire, you, you have the problem of suppression and then, you know, all kinds of complications. Subconscious will start acting on you and you start behaving like a mad person. So, this is the path. 
within the limit acceptable way of earning you know money and then leading a ethical life whatever that ethics might mean to you or to the society and then of course liberation you can achieve you know after leading sufficient uh, yeah, sufficient uh, you know there are of course people do say that brahmacharya you know grahastha sanyasa sanyasa last of course vana prastha before that and so on so living in harmony is more important and then next in order to live in harmony you need to care for you know environmental ethics and environmental ethics these days we understand very much because it is creating havoc we need to you know sort of maybe don't have wars and so on or don't burn forest or staple in you know punjab and haryana and so on so if you live in that kind of environmental friendly caring for earth caring for other human beings and so on so you can be living happily and anyone here in the morning i had a kind of you know note saying that look it is advaita is not a universal religion but advaita is universal philosophy spiritual philosophy religion is misunderstood in many ways and one of the core things will be you have a deity you will have a deity and then you have some kind of rituals this that prayers whatever manner in which you pray in advaita there is no prayer of this kind if you have realized brahman because you are free from all the rituals and all kinds of constraints which we generally find in common man thank you very much um, sir you are pointing that if it is real then there is no maya but many times we are pointing that in brahman itself there is maya so then that means brahman is not real so those who i mean i am saying in advaita shankara himself will say that if you have really reached that level of brahman then there is no maya at all for you therefore there is no maya in brahman if you are asking the question that if maya how what is the status of maya it is shakti some people say that it is shakti of brahman itself is maya so it is one of brahman itself so therefore brahman cannot have maya at all in the sense that we will have maya so it is we who have ignorance who are in adhyasa they will have problem not brahman himself so it is you have to see from which point of view that you know maya is there in brahman so for us maya is there in brahman apne abhi kaha ki brahman bhuti ek pramaan ke roop mein nahi hai meaning of knowledge to jo bhi so prakash vadi hai kyunki agar hum metaphysically dekha jaye ki brahm ko agar hum tatva manenge to tatva ke liye kisi pramaan ki avashyakta hogi ghat patati ke liye hum jo is empirical usme dekhte hain तो अब ब्रह्म है या शून्यता है या बौद्धों का विज्ञानवाद है स्वयं में शांत रक्षित कहते हैं यह में आत्मसमृति तस् या आजड रूपता जड़ भिन्न होना चैतन्य रूपता होना ही उसकी आत्मसमृति है और यहाँ तक कि प्रज्ञाकर कहते हैं कि तस्मात स्वसंवेदन में द्वैतम अपरस अभावात तात्पर्य है कि वहां पर प्रमाण प्रमेय द्वैत रह ही नहीं जाता प्रमाण ही स्वयं प्रमेय रूप हो जाता है यहाँ तक कि वो स्वसंवेदन को अद्वैत कहते हैं जो कि विज्ञानवादी बौद्ध कहते हैं तो स्वप्रकाशता में लेकिन अब कहना क्या है प्रमाण क्या चाहिए तो प्रमाण के लिए इसीलिए क्या कहते हैं वेदांतियों ने कहा कि ब्रह्म वृत्ति व्याप्त है फल व्याप्त नहीं फल व्याप्तता से बच गए क्योंकि अगर व्यक्ति व्यापक फल व्याप भी बता लेंगे तो घटपटादी की तरह हो जाएगा तो यह जो मेरा कहना मैं उसमें मेरा कोई क्वेश्चन नहीं है मेरा तात्पर्य यह है कि वहां पर प्रमाण प्रमेय भाव की बात हो ही नहीं सकती है
तो फिर भी कहना है कि उसमें प्रमाण क्या है तो वो उसी तरह से ही है कि दैट इज द क्वेश्चन बाय ऑर्डिनरी पीपल व्हाट इज द प्रमाण सो वंस यू रियलाइज यूर सेल्फ यू वॉन्ट आस्क दैट क्वेश्चन एट ऑल बिकॉज यू आर ऑलरेडी यूर सेल्फ यू डोंट नीड टू हैव एन समबडी एल्स टू नो यूर सेल्फ सो यू नो यूर सेल्फ सो आत्मन realizes that he is the brahman once that is happened for whom you need pramana when we say ki main professor dn tiwari sir se puchunga ki banaras ke paan ka taste kaisa hai so he will have to tell me and if he will not tell me he will say ki खुद खाना पड़ेगा अब मेरे बस की खाना है नहीं तो हाउ डाई यू नो कंटम्पलेट विद दिस इशू आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू नो अगर आई एम नॉट कैपेबल टू रीच दैट एटलीस्ट यू हैव टू से समथिंग अबाउट दैट एंड इफ यू कैन नॉट से दैट थिंग वुड नॉट बी मीनिंगफुल एट ऑल सो दिस इज द इशू देर वुड अगेन अगेन दिस इशू विल अराइज दैट सो यू हैव नॉट मेड द डिस्टिंगशन बिटवीन वर्बल नॉलेज एंड एक्सपीरियंस नॉलेज सो इवन इफ आई टेल यू वॉट इज द you know rasgulla became a debate once you know odisha people saying it is their item and bengali saying that it is original item from you know bengal so when this debate went on we could only read and know it verbally but reality who has eaten first or who has made if you had record who has made earliest you know bengali sweet that rasgulla then matter would have been over history would have solved the problem we didn't know therefore there was a debate so verb knowledge is one experience knowledge is and another you have to reiterate that other for other eh bas ek line ek line ya ek minute ek minute all these the entire plurality within vedanta also there are very variety and they are clashing with each other whether it's a buddhism or vedant or any one they have internal wo ladai internal bhi karte hain bahar se bhi ladte rehte hain there is a line chandrakirti has caught yad yad yas priyam tat tat tas samachare जो आपको लगता है अच्छा उसी का आचरण करते हैं चॉइस फैक्टर ये जितनी बात है संसार में ये अपनी अपनी चीजें हैं कि मैं नहीं कर रहा यद यद यस प्रेम जिसको जो मार्केट में जाइए सभी लोग मार्केट में चले मॉल में तो इसमें से एक भी बता दीजिए कि 100 परसेंट जो है कुछ एक तत्व है वैरायटी है इसलिए ये थिंकिंग में भी ये थॉट कंस्ट्रक्शन में भी भी ये सारे आर्गुमेंट्स में भी देखिए इसलिए आपको अच्छा लगा आपने पसंद लेकर करिए कोई परफेक्ट नहीं बनाता है एक नहीं है यदि यद से प्रेम आप कहीं भी जाइए सामान देखिए मिठाई के दुकान पर जाइए हम लसगुल्ला खाएंगे जी हम लड्डू खाएंगे जी हम ज्यादा गुलगप्पा खाएंगे जी ये खाएंगे ये कपड़ा खा लेगी जी ये कह जी वो जितने दे दिख लीजिए ये ये चीज सवाल यह है कि सलूशन कहां से आएगा कौन देगा न्याय देगा बुद्धिज्म देंगे कि अदंत देंगे शंकराचार्य देंगे सुरेश्वराचार्य देंगे कि गौड़पात देंगे कि ये ये वाली जो है एक सौ आठ तो आपके जो है उपनिषद है क्वेश्चन ये है कि फिलोसफी है कहा फिलोसफी कैसे स्टेब्लिश होगी बस ये यदि यह दे जाते हुए दिस इज ए वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट लाइन आई एम टेलिंग यू कॉमेंट सर अद्वैत वेदांत के बारे में जो कुछ आपका इंटरप्रिटेशन आपने दिया मैं समझता हूं कि अद्वैत वेदांत की जो टर्मिलोजीज हैं उस टर्मिलोजीज के तहत अगर हम देखें तो शायद आपकी कुछ प्रश्न आपके व्याख्यान के विरुद्ध खड़े हो सकते हैं फॉर एग्जांपल मैं कहूं 
पूरे के पूरे भारतीय दर्शन में साधन और प्रमाण इन दोनों को एक मान लिया गया किसी वस्तु के देखने में हमारा साधन भी प्रत्यक्ष है और अगर कोई पूछता है कि कैसे आप कह रहे हैं कि ये वस्तु है हम कहते हैं इसमें प्रत्यक्ष प्रमाण है तो साधन और प्रमाण इन दोनों को एक साथ हमने करके व्यक्ति को बता दिया कि आपने प्रत्यक्ष किया है देख लीजिए उसने मुझसे पूछा कि कैसे आप कह रहे हो तो हम कह रहे हैं क्या बात कह रहे हैं आप प्रत्यक्ष ही प्रमाण है इसके बारे में तो एक तो साधन और प्रमाण इन दोनों की स्वीकार्यता भारतीय दर्शन के प्राय सभी संप्रदायों में हो गई पाई इसीलिए शायद प्रमाणों के प्रमाण के संदर्भ में जब भ्रम के सिद्धांत की स्थिति आई तो हमें प्रमाणवाद की आवश्यकता पड़ी कि हमारा प्रमाण प्रमाणिक है कि नहीं है उसकी परीक्षा के लिए हुआ है अद्वैत वेदांत में जिस लेवल की बात की गई है उस लेवल तक तो प्रमाण की जहां तक प्रमाण की पहुंच है वहां तक प्रमाण की बात की गई माया का जहां तक संदर्भ में संदर्भ है जो मैंने समझा है माया को अद्वैत वेदांत में माया जिस तरह की परिभाषा के माध्यम से उसकी व्याख्या हो रही है अगर हम लिंग्विस्टिकली अगर देखने की कोशिश करें तो माया एक लॉजिक है जिस लॉजिक के तहत आचार्य शंकर ब्रह्म और जगत के संबंधों के बीच की व्याख्या करना चाहते हैं एक सत्य है दूसरे को मिथ्या कह रहे हैं दोनों के बीच के संबंध की व्याख्या वो कैसे करेंगे शायद यह वैसे ही है जैसे हम मानते हैं जब हम गणित का सूत्र हल करते हैं जब हमको कोई चीज नहीं मालूम होती है तो हम कहते हैं सपोज देर इज एन एक्स तो माया ये समथिंग लाइक देर इज एन एक्स थ्रू विच वी सॉल्व द प्रॉब्लम तो माया को हमको के दिक्कत हमारी यह है कि हमारी बुद्धि की जो दो कैटेगरीज केवल हमारे पास है कि या तो दिन होगा या तो रात होगी तीसरा कुछ नहीं हो सकता क्यों नहीं हो सकता जो हम कहते हैं कि शाम हो गई न रात है न दिन है क्यों हम कहते हैं कि वो ब्रह्म मुहूर्त है सुबह है वो न रात है न दिन है आखिर ये लाफ इक्लूडेड मिलिक की पर जो हमारी बुद्धि काम करती है शंकराचार्य यही तो बात कह रहे हैं कि ये ला ऑफ इक्लूडेड मिडिल से ऊपर जब हम जाएंगे तो ये सारे प्रमाण प्रमेय ये सब समाप्त हो जाएंगे ये सारे प्रमाण प्रमेय केवल वही तक है जहां तक लाफ इक्लूडेड मिडिल है अन्यथा ज्ञाते वही तब न भी जाते तुलसीदास कह रहे हैं कि सो जान जय देह जनाई जान तो तुम ही तुम्हें हो जाए तो ये तो जिस लेवल की बात है वहां प्रमाण की कोई गति नहीं है प्रमाण तो वहीं तक है जहां प्रमाण और प्रमेय इन दोनों का संदर्भ खड़ा होता है थैंक यू सर सर समथिंग टू से लैंग्वेज इज इन सच ए वे दैट यू नो ऑल दी सो कॉल्ड you know the so called mahavakyas they are identity statements and there are always two things that are compared so in verbally you know when you say tatvamasi so two things have to be put in sentence and say it is one so it is the limitation of the language when it comes to brahmanubhava there are not you know till you have got the brahmano bhava you would have said yes i am self i am trying to know the brahman all that you can say but when you realize that you are brahman where are the two things there are no two things that is the identity identity in experience not in language a is a if you say identity in logical identity even there two occurrences of a will be required this a and this a one and the same you are saying so language it is the limitation of language where it cannot capture brahmanubhava at all that is why you cannot describe brahman at all it has you know it is the foundation of why only language of human beings even so that's why you know the he is very right in saying that you cannot but well veda supanishad you know they have indicated don't say they have told they are authorities if you grant them authority believe in that well you all have verbal knowledge that there is atman and brahman one and the same there is only verbal knowledge that's why brahmanu bhava is needed otherwise chaturvedis trivedis the way this all would have been you know they have read all these vedas they would have all automatically liberated people 
unfortunately not all of them thank you thank you so much sir for your wonderful lecture and now our next speaker is uh, professor godavarish mishra sir i would request you to come over the podium and deliver the lecture over to you sir Yeah. So, uh, respected uh, Professor Pradhan and uh, co panelists, participants, and distinguished uh, Assembly of Scholars and uh, all those who are here, thanks to Professor Anand Misra and the organizers for this opportunity uh, at the Banaras University, Banaras Hindu University, which is a great uh, center for learning as far as uh, Advaita is concerned. And uh, you know, I'm very happy that this occasion made this possible for me to come here and speak. Friends, uh, I would like to start from Professor Pradhan. I would like to start from one observation Professor Pradhan made, either intentionally or inten unintentionally, I do not know, but at a, a presentation in Surat, he said that India was not subjugated in every aspect. It was only subjugated politically large number of large part of its culture was not not subjugated at many parts of the country which is why this this subjugation in the total sense was not visible to us like we are not politically still there is a lot of things in which we do not we we are not subjugated one is this philosophical subjugation because many people in our country never thought they are eroded or their thinking was misrepresented by the others because they do not know what is happening to them in other parts of the world. They were not bothered who <laughs> they told what and that is why there is no subjugation. Subjugation is only a, you know, as a mental thing. Physical subjugation was there. Political subjugation was there, but cultural, this so called, if you bring philosophy, if you are per, if you permit me, philosophical subjugation was not there. Very important. Uh, did you get it from some other book or it is your own? Uh, uh, do you remember that you said something like that? Uh, that's right. It's a great thing, you know, and I am going from there to another another thing which is superimposed on the host from the West and which has taken a lot of our time to understand ourselves because we are trying to get out of this covering, get out of this superimposition that has been made by the West on us. And a large part of the modern Advaita, like Advaita after independence mostly, before also, has been, you know, because of such a thing of our tradition being read by the West. And why did this happen? And even today, there are large number of people, there is many scholars in our country who say that this is wrong, this is wrong. And, you know, 
that, that it is another problem to be discussed my i come to my second point which is miscommunication and non communication friends i would like to tell you when shankara wrote a text somewhere in the south india the commentary was written in nepal near nepal darbhanga by vachaspati mishra and when vachaspati mishra wrote bhamati on shankara bhasya okay and when bhamati was written a commentary is written by tamil nadu in tamil nadu by appa dikhita and when he writes something a commentary is written in gujarat by uh, ananda ananda bodha you know see the country how a type of communication was going on and see today we are in a, with all the communications we don't have communication like it is mainly because of on understanding sorry no like it is it is another point i am coming to on understanding and misunderstanding given by the west we are only jumping around the words because there is a language support is not there when professor bhat was telling beautifully was telling like you know linguistic liberty you know we have some linguistic liberty but this linguistic liberty is not a only a western thing that is there even now in our tradition there is a lot of linguistic liberty we have taken to the hetu and pratyaya in non buddhist traditions are absolutely different from buddhist traditions you know go to chandrakirti go to nagarjuna how they put no hetu and pratyaya absolutely it is not the same way you understand hetu pratyaya in our traditions linguistic liberty has been so carefully uh, taken and uh, you know uh, that is why um, and that is why i would like to uh, say my third point that is you know this this create every school this linguistic uh, liberty creates a uh, what philosophical territorialism if i am permitted to say a philosophical territory you built, you built around you this is my periphery you know even if you see the buddhist and agarjuna especially or asanga you see and abhitens this is our periphery nayakas like don't like don't try to deal with this in this way this is what i meant by this he says what he means then you come to the philosophy this is third thing i would like to say and therefore you know the most of the see dr prasad was telling that why this why so much of fighting professor prasad i wanted to tell you tell everybody with like i am not going to my paper if time does not permit but one thing i wanted to tell you when we talk to each other from different angles we learn we don't we don't i don't say oh no no prasad what you told is wrong no a eh, please uh, sanjay so uh, when i learn from you even if i get defeated there is a very famous anecdote between nagasena and milinda nagasena the saint is talking to milinda and he says your uh, lordship milinda is the king when two kings fight and one is defeated the other say kill his head ki, uh, chop off his head kill him when who two scholars fight and one gets defeated the defeated person feels obliged to the other and learns from him it is a give and take you know it is not like a two 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 chickens or or two bulls fighting everybody learns and feels it is an evolving thing that is what has happened in and through the philosophy and one more thing one more point i wanted to tell you now many people say that indian philosophy is dead there is nothing that is happening especially professor prasad he, he always says after 15th century why is he in doing philosophy and i don't know professor pradhan was there professor pahi and uh, professor prasad was a physical fight in bhuneshwar about these things he told that do you think that uh, kesi bhattacharya is not a philosopher arabindo is not a philosopher what do you know he, he he simply abused him i i want to tell you like they are all great people there are no more there 
with these things friends i would like to bring you bring before you a very brilliant item to which few of you already have given a reference daniel gave um, and dilip that gave or all of you gave professor malkani it comes from a place which was not funded by the any king any uh, government uh, institution because uh, why i am telling government institution professor tiwari we had lot of scholarship no money lot of money very less scholarship when teeth is tooth are good coconut is not there when coconut has come no tooth to die so that is the state we are on so anyway professor malkani not that it is a bad scene it happens now and then we are, i am very hopeful that we will be able to do much better philosophy in the days to come we have people who are great very creative people you know therefore you know the, the, as i told you in the beginning the language problem and therefore i all the times feel that how important it is that we must speak in our native languages hindi and that is why i always feel that just because sanskritic philosophy has not been practiced does not mean that it is not practiced in other languages other ways so anyway with that i wanted to bring you to take you from here to amalnar a small village somewhere in north maharashtra and a place promoted by a businessman called pratap seth by inviting a few people and one among those is professor keshi bhattacharya murti vaya krishna um, this uh, uh, malkani and malkani was his first research scholar malkani comes there and stays with uh, keshi bhattacharya and they start doing philosophy and malkani's career starts with pratap seth ends with pratap seth because every time whatever business profit he gets he invests there and when he died the center got closed so the lot of like such a brilliant like i don't think there is any place in our country like that we have religions there are many religious places who promote the want to promote philosophy in their own way but free thinking it was only promoted by pratap seth having such a lot of people see imagine who are not who is who of indian philosophy of yesterday were promoted by pratap seth that was the situation i am that like wish there will be many people in our country who will be able to do such a thing anyway so what i wanted to do is you know uh, i wanted to bring you to this uh, person the, uh, the the malkani and just read through and whenever my time is over just tell me because long paper i have written thinking that i will have a lot of time but i don't have time i know like that is not possible to speak uh, more than 20 30 minutes please allow me if time permits so in and what i am telling is about him from from of malkani you know why i am telling that westerners have really tried to uh, you know put us in a very different way not tarnish the our image sometimes they did but they have they have slowly try to you know uh, give their opinion into our opinion that might be a linguistic problem also i do not take the new vedanta as it is given today the new vedanta to me can be a new vedanta for few thinkers but not all of all 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 people mahadevan was not a new vedanta you know even though he wrote in in in, in english he was not a new vedanta he was a traditional vedanta you can say with vivekananda ji new vedanta and there are some but there are many who are not new they are putting new they are making a again dividing the whole 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 whole, whole tradition into many anyway i am not going to that so in contemporary indian philosophy the presence of vedanta is visibly strong since it has mass appeal number one and has prominent presence among the academia in indian philosophy universities so its origin is from the vedas that has an antiquity antiquity of several millennia vedanta has been coming down in an unbroken manner till our times in and through the vicissitudes of prasthanas and prakaranas being the major theme of many varieties of writings in vernacular languages 
the classical vedanta is taken up by non classical contemporary scholars and they have given their own interpretations by keeping the core intact and i'm just trying to say about malkani how he is writing a bhasya in english not a single place i have found where he has swerved from the tradition the core is intact the peri periphery expands so uh, so the yeah yeah the period especially after independence is also marked by contemporary philosophy this is another thing contemporary philosophy sorry comparative philosophy championed by large number of scholars like sarvapalli radhakrishnan and like uh, and and venkateshi bhattacharya and others there are others who also contributed to bulk of philosophy in india analyzing the indian philosophy with western methodology so that indian modern man would be is like it would be easy for the modern man to understand and have access to the great tradition of philosophy for which india is well known rasbihari das dm datta tmp pt raju i would say pt raju is one of the best of our times he was alive during our times jr malkani murti ganeshwar mishra r bala subramanyam ramakant sinhari and one of the most celebrated personality from this place is ramakant tripathi r k tripathi you know he is such a like one has to read his writings to know how much deeply he was involved in vedanta he was not a new vedanta he was a vedantin as a vedantin of the time of the like of the traditional times professor professor pradhan is his student he must be knowing better than i feel i feel envy of you that i did not know him that you knew him such a great scholar professor r k tripathi so one of the profound um, thinkers is malkani and let me go to malkani so ganeshan das malkani you know 92 1890 to 1977 is an outstanding exponent of indian philosophy and indian philosophy means for him advaita vedanta and advaita vedanta for means not indian philosophy philosophy so that is how he built up the whole school and you know i don't know another another 20 minutes or whatever 10 minutes whatever what i can do malkani succeeded the second director of the institute of amalnar indian institute of philosophy in the year 1935 and continued up to 1966 till the institute was closed because of the death of pratap said the founder of the institution style and objective of Mal malkani see what i have done in my this presentation is i have read malkani almost all the books which i have been doing for some times and i have tried to summarize it by to in order to focus is the, the highlights of his thinking so unlike traditional vedantic exponents of the texts malkani admits in his own writings that his writings are neither text based nor to be treated from an orientalist perspective he claims to have approached the vedanta he uh, daniel please so he he seem daniel please so he claims to have approached the vedanta as a free time ho gaya okay so i think i will read the conclusion okay so uh, so uh, you know i am i'm just in the first page and uh, so what he is doing is doing philosophy the method and content this is uh, what five minutes are there so let me tell you something before i conclude uh, like uh, uh, he says that indian philosophy is not a view of life it is a way of life and uh, so uh, he makes uh, Uh, he makes like a candid confession as to how philosophers conceal their ignorance in their conceit and shows that there is scope for presenting the subtle philosophical thinking in simple language without clothing it in jargon and making verbose statements so this is uh, one of the major things and intention intuition and knowledge in vedantic sense he brings a word called intuition and gives a lot of meaning into understanding that what is intuition so one of the essays intellect and intuition malkani deals with two questions is intuition a distinct mode of knowledge or is there an intuition of the ultimate reality so this is being discussed and uh, malkani says like uh, 
can the question as to how we understand the content can be answered if we say that it is the 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 knowledge it is its own content so and it knows nothing apart from himself and in this sense it is ever realized and ground of all knowledge and in another uh, i say malkani says that if there is an intuition of the ultimate reality that reality cannot be distinct from the intuition of it and intuition that we do not have at present can be differentiated from the intuitions that we have or uh, and its content it cannot be non relational as it would involve subject object distinction this relation is another point that has to be uh, very that uh, that has been very critically analyzed hence there cannot be an intuition of the ultimate reality if it is an intuition which we did not have please see therefore what is the content of brahman knowledge is it without a uh, devoid of everything or it has some content and therefore he he quotes you know he did not quote see one thing that i found in uh, um, malkani the many times what he says you can bring the paragraphs from shankara and try to see that it is an analysis of that paragraph it is analysis of that idea so here he is trying to explain he has not written this is my reading the adyatan's idea of impartite mode akhanda akara vritti jnana against the against the vritti jnana in explaining his uh, his uh, his idea of intuition and what is the relation between knowledge and self that is another problem he brings in see he says that self is non relational how he has done i, I have not not much time there for i am not going into that but the questions i, I just raise like which i would not be able to explain is the self a real substance needed to account for knowledge or is knowledge identical with the self or distinct from it these are the two things he is discussing and uh, then the third point you know uh, like here also he goes to say like is there is there any content of the this knowledge or there is no content he brings in what shankara says nayam ekantena abhishaya this is a very important thing that you cannot say it is devoid of all the contents like this is the main thing he he wants to he brings out and uh, i am very quickly coming to my uh, then another very important point he brings in can there be a philosophy without presupposition the same logical positivistic idea that metaphysics should be you know uh, like uh, the, 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 there is you know no, no point in appreciating something which has been spoken in terms of metaphysics and malkani is dealing with that that there cannot be any thinking without any presupposition that you know i wanted to add to that 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 there is no presupposition itself is a presupposition so uh, malkani deals with that and uh, he says uh, malkani tries to conclude that the truth is absolute and ultimate in iman uh, ultimate is immanent in our uh, experience and is self evidently true it involves no presupposition all presuppositions are warded off are discarded and it can only be seen in vedantic parlance it is aparoksha jnana this is very important aparoksha jnana so so therefore it is not mystical you know mysticism will have something which you know how can how can you say that i see something i know myself how can it be how can it be uh, for uh, like a uh, mystical mystical means something which is uh, difficult like uh, not uh, you you can always if mystic his way of putting it is that what you see ho gaya sir i am i am coming to my so internal implications of philosophy there is another point i am i am just uh, going uh, fast sir uh, two minutes you give me uh, um, so authority of the shruti this is another important point which malkani brings before us is the authority of the shruti shruti and here i wanted to tell you one thing that which mahanti says you know as a footnote as to him he says what is apurusha like uh, uh, professor bhat was dealing with that he was telling that when it is a statement of fact it is apurusha and when there is a, like uh, like uh, mahanti says that uh, uh, you know he says uh, that when there is the 
the apurishatva is the concept of primacy and autonomy of the eminent text over the objective intention of the author the objective intention of the author and the preeminence of the text is something which he takes so uh, so that is what one thing i wanted to tell you and the last part of my uh, paper what i have done is you know how he has tried to project uh bhattacharya keshi bhattacharya what he is doing is he has a lot of in the book beginning all the books he will have keshi bhattacharya because he was he started his career with keshi bhattacharya but he says if there is anything where keshi bhattacharya departs from shankara i am not with keshi bhattacharya you know very clearly he uh, g r malkani t r b murthy bas bihari das you know they are together i wrote an article uh, uh like the, uh, they they went together like in, in many things their thinking was uh, almost same uh, so uh, i know uh, so what is the what is what is what is, what is adhyasa he, he puts satya anruta mithuna you know that huh? Sat yeah satya anrute mithuni krutya an anaisarga koyam loka vyavaharah he is putting that and uh, now uh, he is telling about the religion and philosophy. Can you brand Indian thinking as a religion? This takes a lot of his, uh, uh, you know, writing, and uh, uh, that is how uh, he uh, takes it. Then creation and illusion is another topic. I come to my conclusion, sir, in another one minute uh, because I have taken a lot of your time. Uh, so, uh, so appearance and reality, and another like very brilliant. Uh, brilliant way of putting and one more thing one more thing he does is his uh, way of admonishing the understanding of daya krishna on advaita vedanta the one big essay has been devoted to write how daya krishna has totally misunderstood advaita and he is trying the the samkhya purusha and advaita brahma are, are are similar that is what daya ji says and uh, uh, then and the another another point where he differs from P.T. Raju is the pure philosophy. What is he, he says? P.T. Raju says that India does not have pure philosophy. He says pure philosophy is only Advaita. There is no pure philosophy anywhere in the world. And Malkani criticizes D.M. DM Datta also inward and outward Advaita. There is one uh, essay. So here you know uh, Datta says that how it is very difficult to understand Kesi Bhattacharya. And which is why Malkani is raising these issues. Malkani says no. It is very clear that T.M. Datta has not been able to do Advaita as it, has, it should have been done. And at, as it is invested by the tradition exclusively, especially Shankara. Uh, so Daya, uh, this, this part deals with Daya Krishna. And uh, you know, uh, uh, many people know about his, uh, his, his criticism about Daya Krishna. I read the conclusion, just one minute, sir. I'm, I'm, I am the last page. The contemporary period in Indian philosophy, especially Vedanta, would have three types of writings. Expository works, as done by Surya Narayana Shastri, TMP Mahadevan, Hiryana, Ganga Nadja, Easter Solomon in the Gujarat, and there is another variety that is analytical Advaita, analytical Vedanta. There are scholars who emphasize on analysis with less or no acquaintance with the traditional texts, have good grounding in Western philosophy and methodology, and many things they raise, brilliant questions giving, and then giving answers like Professor Daya Krishna did, I, I put him in that basket. And the critical scholars who again are versed in tradition, with or without much acquaintance in science, uh, classical texts, but have excellent understanding of the tradition, which is reflected in their writings, and that reflects their concern for philosophy in India. In this group, I will put Kaish Keshi Bhattacharya, Jain Mahanti, Malkani. They have brought fresh air and new vitality to the understanding and interpretation of Indian philosophy. And with their background in the Western thoughts, they have brought noble ideas into the analysis, traditional analysis, with profundity of thought and clarity of expression. So the entire philosophical joining of Malkani is in and through one theme that is Advaita. He is an Advaitin with unparalleled zeal to prove that the philosophy starts and ends with Advaita. There is a the body finished.
Yeah, we we'll have. Yeah. It's got, it's got a lot of income. Yeah, uh, we were talking about the authority of the Shruti and the Brahma Gyan. And we were talking also about the problem of the language, the Western people who are commenting. <clears throat> but uh, I guess in Brahma Gyan or in Shruti, like how we are having the Puranas in our religion, uh, there it is not written in if that particular God is coming from that particular place or it's talking that particular language. I guess there it is not a problem of language in Brahma Gyan. No? Because we are not saying... देखिए एक बहुत ही इंपॉर्टेंट चीज है जो हमने डिस्कस नहीं किया है इतना शेयर किया है हिंदी में इसलिए बोल रहे हैं फिर इंग्लिश में ट्रांसलेशन बाद में कर देंगे नहीं लेकिन मैं नहीं करूंगा आप देखिए एक इंपॉर्टेंट चीज देखिए इतना बड़ा ट्रेडिशन दस हजार का और यहाँ फिलोसॉफिकल जो डिस्कशन होता है इसका आउटपुट कहाँ है आउटपुट जो है वो आउटपुट जो है यह जो है समन्वय है और समन्वय का मतलब ये होता है देखिए मेरी थीसिस है और मैं इसको डेवलप कर रहा हूं कि जो समन्वय है जो एक तो सूत्र में ही है इस समन्वय में एक का खून दूसरे में बह रहा है इंक्लूसिविज्म जिसको कहते हैं आप सोचिए और इससे सिविलाइजेशनल जो वैल्यूज बनी हुई है हमारे भारत की उसने सस्टेन किया है वहां कंफ्लिक्ट वो नहीं है जो फिलोसफर्स में होता है तो सिंक्रिटिज्म जो है समन्वय जो है स्टार्टिंग पॉइंट है और उसने जो सिविलाइजेशनल वैल्यूज दिया है वो वही जो है जिसको हम लोग ये और जिस तरह से देखिए आप वेदों से उपनिषद उपनिषद आई है चाहे और भी हो चाहे बुद्धिज्म हो बुद्धिज्म का उसमें उसका उसमें उसका इसमें उसका उसमें द्वैत का अद्वैत का प्लुरलिज्म का सारे का खून बढ़ रहा है न्याय का खून जो है अद्वैत में फट रहा है क्योंकि व्यवहार के बिना नहीं चलेगा उसका खून उसमें उसका खून उसमें रहे इसलिए समन्वय जो है हम दैप देखिए कि पूरा जो एक सिविलाइजेशन बढ़ रहा है और एक जो कल्चर पैदा हो रहा है ये उसका आउट मतलब ये तरह से कह लीजिए उसका जो है एक इम्पैक्ट है और वो उसने दिया है इसके बावजूद भी क्योंकि इंक्लूसिविज्म हमारी पॉलिसी है थैंक यू सो मच सर एंड विदाउट फर्दर अदू आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट प्रोफेसर प्रधान टू कम ओवर द पोडियम एंड गिव हिज प्रेसिडेंशियल रिमार्क नो मोर क्वेश्चन सॉरी from the organizer side they have given the last word so i am sorry if we could not entertain more questions uh, my job is not to give another discourse it is yeah. only to thank the speakers the audience and the and the organizers of course uh, all the three speakers are very eminent philosophers of our country uh, professor mahanta has uh, given certain objections to the anivarchaneta uh, khyati and there has been response from the advaitins i think there is a deep problem here we must respect it that philosophy doesn't demand a final solution it only raises the questions perhaps we have to rethink uh, revisit the uh, advaita theory of error uh, professor bart also has emphasized uh, on this aspect and he has really questioned if it is sat from one side and asat from another where do you go sat asat will be another mixture but that will not help us he has also raised a very pertinent question and he has also emphasized that pramanubhava is is not a method of course it is not a means it is the end uh, the process of realization so pramanubhava i think admittedly uh, it is admitted by other things that that is the only uh, way to uh, Uh, no brahman and thereby to be brahman and to attain what we call moksha or freedom professor misra has uh, really taken a larger view of the whole landscape he has seen how advaita has been 
uh, either misunderstood, miscommunicated, and he has emphasized the point that, which really Casey Bhattacharya also emphasized in his as in ideas, that our country was subjugated politically, maybe physically, but never intellectually, because that spirit of Indian philosophical quest remained as it was even in the British days and in the post-independence era. That is why we are debating here how the Indian Advaitic consciousness has reaffirmed itself. And uh, today's seminar is also a kind of reaffirmation of the same consciousness, the Advaitic uh, affirmation about the unity of the universe, unity of mankind. I think that is an eternal truth which will come again and again. And uh, so that point he has emphasized. And also he has emphasized G.R. Malkani. I think he is one of the greatest Advaitins in the post-independent uh, era. And I don't know if there is any other paper on Malkani. But he has given the gist of Malkani's uh, defense of Advaita as the only philosophy. I think that is a very radical stand and uh, many may not agree. But the point that has emerged from our discussion is that there is a Samanya, which is uh, which Professor Prasad has emphasized, that this give and take will continue. And that is the spirit of philosophy. There is no defeat here. There is no victory. Uh, it is all understanding, self-understanding, understanding of the other, and mutual give and take. Western philosophy has itself shown us uh, as a counter uh, standpoint that they borrow from each other and yet they proceed further. So they talk about Plato and yet go beyond Plato. We have to talk about Advaita. Maybe we, there will be a genius who will also tell something like, uh, for example, Sri Aurobindo, to talk something about the traditional Advaita. That is how philosophy grows. So with these words, I really thank all the three eminent speakers. And also I thank all the audience who have really uh listen very carefully and attentively your questions remain with you but you can express those questions to the speakers later on and lastly i thank the organizers professor uh, anand misraji uh, who has brought us together here so that's why we are debating here and priyanka ji is here to guide us and i thank her thank you everybody Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your quick remarks. And now the session has come to an end. Um, there is no tea break. Uh, so you are requesting everybody to be here with us uh, because we have uh, one more session. And uh, so I thank, you, I thank you all for joining us today. Please be with us so that we can start our next session. Hello. Uh, may I have your attention, please? Good, Good evening, everyone. Once again in the hall, we are going to start a new technical session that is uh, being held in the hybrid mode. And uh, our, all the participants will be joining us online. And I hope that, uh, that all have already joined us. As I can see, Pane Selvam, sir. Uh, A.K. Raj, sir, and other Divijay Mishraji and K. Vengadachalam and others are there. So uh, without wasting any moment, I request the chair of the session, Professor D.N. Tiwari. Sir, please come on the dais and take your seat. And I request all the participants and audiences, please have your seat. Okay, so uh, the session is to be presided over by Professor D.N. Tiwari, former head and professor of this very department, D.H.U. Varansi. And the first speaker, 
I'm going to invite. I can't see whether uh, Professor R P Singh sir has joined us or not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. As I can see him. Yeah. I am also there. First speaker is there. Yes, sir. Th thank you so much, sir. So, Professor R P Singh, Professor, Center for Philosophy, School of Social Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and he is the first speaker of this session. Sir, mic is handed over to you now. So, should I start now? Professor Tiwari, good, good evening. Want to say something? Yes, sir, you start, please. Okay, thank you very much and good evening to everybody. So, it's indeed a great pleasure for me to participate in this wonderful seminar, Post-Independence Indian Philosophy, uh, organized by the Department of Philosophy and Religion, Banaras Hindu University, and good friend of mine, Professor Anand Mishra, and some of my former students like Dr. Rahul, Priyanka, and others. They are all instrumental to organizing this uh, session. And I'm also happy to see my very dear friend, Professor Panir Silvam, in the session. And namaste. And uh, uh, since the time is the constraint and we are already running too late, so without much ado, I'll just uh, come to the main discussion of it. So the theme which I have chosen is uh, the realm between transcendent and immanent, K. Sachidananda Murthy's Vedantic perspective. I would like to first clarify two issues and then I'll move further. First thing is that uh, post independence India is a continuity of the contemporary India, which itself is a continuity of the medieval and also of the ancient Indian philosophy. So there, is, there has been no rupture or break into it. But some of the issues which have been highlighted uh, are of a specific importance. And this is where I place the post uh, independent independence India, Indian philosophy. This is one submission. Uh, second thing is that I have little reservation saying Indian philosophy. I think I should say philosophies in India. There are various philosophical traditions which have emerged and developed in India. And uh, that is a very remarkable feature. The plurality is something which is very uh, remarkable about Indian philosophy. And post-independence India is no exception. It was there in the uh, contemporary Indian philosophy, in the medieval philosophy, and also in the, I know, the Vedas and the Upanishads. There also we find all these things happening. Yet another little clarification is that, that uh, like the contemporary Indian philosophy, post-independence Indian philosophers, uh, barring a few exceptions to some of the philosophers, mostly everybody is in Western philosophy also. So, and whereas in the West, when modernity came, or the so-called post-modernity started coming up, they started repudiating the past. In India, there has been a you know, revival and revitalization of it. The contemporary trend, the contem comparative philosophy, is something which is at the, you know at the backbone of uh, the in, in post independence India. Most of the philosophers uh, whom I have studied with, and uh, they all were doing some kind of comparative philosophy or the other. And so, so with this to few clarification, let me just come to uh, Professor K. Sachidananda Murthy. And we all know that he was, uh, you know, uh, yeah, almost, uh, you know, the last uh, five, six decades of uh, Indian philosophy goes much to it to his, you know, credit, goes much to his credit. And he has an all comprehensive scholarship and intellectual vision. He dealt with most of the themes on consciousness and values, including epistemological questions. And also he raised not only uh, epistemological questions which were raised not only by the Indian philosophers, but also you know, from the West, like Kant, Hegel, Marx, Feuerbach, you know, they all we are, you know, in his uh, philosophy. The book I have chosen is the realm between, on which I'm, I'm basically trying to focus on. And uh, the book, uh, you know, it begins with suffering, kind of an attempt that suffering is some kind of a reality and we all have to 
make some kind of reflection or the other on it. So what I have attempted to develop more this quest is to articulate something and later on uh, this term finds its uh, expression nuance manner in Marx known as alienation uh, or estrangement in Hegel or reification and many various are there. And uh, not only suffering and alienation, but also emancipation from the philosophical journey, especially with reference to Upanishads, Buddhism, etc., on the one hand, and on the other, Kant, Hegel, Feuerbach, and Marx, uh, as studied in the realm between them. So these were the lectures which he has given on the philosophy of religion. The term realm between has been borrowed from Heidegger's The Realm in Between. You know, there's a term he has used in being and time, the realm in between. Uh, but uh, the contextualizing, uh, the contextualities are quite different one. Uh, in fact, uh, also Murthy has contextualized it in a different manner. The book has been divided to various chapters, various issues are there. But uh, what uh, also Murthy is suggesting is that uh, he has taken up, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, uh, you know, from a quotation from Brihada Runyak Upanishad, and uh, the details are, you know, there. So, which, which is rendered in English by the author as standing in intermediate condition, one sees both these conditions, namely being in the world and being in the other world. This is the kind of, you know, a new thing reason he has taken it, though it is deeply rooted in tradition itself, but he was trying to re-articulate it in a certain manner. Thus, the realm between uh, falls in the juncture, it is called Ubhay Asthane, Sandhi Asthane, and uh, the immanent and as well as the transcendent. In addition to this, uh, in, in a situation like this, one is able to see both the evils and the joys in the works of Murti. The, the, the purport of the text is, it is possible for man to become aware of both immanence and transcendence of evil and the good, of suffering and delight. It is it is curious to that Professor Murthy chose to reflect on one of the pairs only that is suffering, uh, that is suffering and uh, suffering, and uh, since the since that seems uh, to lie on the side of the middle, that is immense to get connected in an intermediate way. And throughout the book, this intimate relation appears to him to form the backbone of the discourse. So the chapters, in fact, they begin with this kind of a statement. Buddha is saying that there is suffering and that there is a cessation of suffering and there is a method of you know, getting rid of this suffering. Now, here, you know, you know, standing in the middle of two things, uh, what Professor Murthy has done, he has taken up a little bit help from Immanuel Kant. And uh, Murthy has taken into uh, comprehensive account of the three critiques of Immanuel Kant, uh, the critique of pure reason. He writes that the defining appearance as everything that cannot be apprehended through space and time, that can be apprehended through space and time, Kant states that the concept of appearance establishes the objective reality of phenomena and justifies the division of objects into phenomena and nomina. So that means there is something beyond phenomena also, and that is nominal entities. So the way we understand it in, Indian, in Vedantic tradition, Vyavaharik Sat and the Paramarthic Sat. And humanity is something which is, you know, standing between them, between Vyavaharik and the Paramarthic Sat. At one place, Kant says that as things are conditioned, they do involve the idea of the unconditioned. This again is something which we find even in Vedanta also. 
that if everything is changing, then there is something in us which is not changing. And that basically taking up the antakrana, mana buddhi, manas buddhi, ahankar, pragya, uh, chitta, uh, and then coming to the sakshil, the witness aspect, is something which is not changing, which can't also has it in terms of I think level consciousness, not I am level consciousness. The way Descartes has said that I think therefore I am. And Kant says that no, I think level consciousness is possible, but not the I am. Because existence has been used in very many ways, you know, by Descartes. For him, mind exists because of thinking, body exists because of extension, God exists because of perfection, absolute perfection. So with one category, he is trying to, you know, articulate the three different entities. And that's something which is very remarkable. And that this idea is flawless and crown and completion of all human knowledge. The distinction between phenomena and nomina, between this world and the other world, by Vyavaharic and Paramarthic, this is how philosophy has tried to develop itself. Not the way dichotomizing it, because the difference between Vyavaharic and Paramarthic is the difference of degrees only, not of the kinds. In Kant, it becomes a kind of, you know, uh, different in, term, in terms of kind because he did not have the intellectual intuition which which is available for Shankara in Vedantic tradition and, and, and Murthy has also acknowledged it. Now there are other details regarding the critique of practical reason also and the critique of judgment uh, about the practical reason the second critique uh, Kant does not in any way contradict the conclusion of the first critique, most people think that uh, there is a contradiction between the first critique and the second critique. But uh, when Kant wrote the first critique, he realized that this text is very incomplete. And he was already started preparing to write the second critique. And before he could have written the second critique, he wrote that answer to the question, what is enlightenment? That was the bridging gap between pure practical reason and the pure reason kind of a thing. So the first thing, we cannot have any knowledge of God. So the knowledge of God is denied here. The faith element has to come up. The moral law is object is universal, either because we are conscious of it a priori, or because freedom of which we are conscious of conscious is deducible from the moral law alone. And this serves uh, to prove that law. Kant expresses both these uh, views. The moral law uh, directly points to the nominal world, but does not give any knowledge of it. So between knowledge and faith, there comes a kind of, you know, gulf, unbridgeable gulf. So freedom, God and immortality have to be presupposed. They cannot be established, you know, through any kind of observation or any kind of, you know, things like that, knowledge element kind of a thing. And the same issue is developed even in the critique of uh, judgment, the third critique of which I am not able to go. But uh, there is, uh, you know, if there is suffering in, uh, in Buddhism, with which Murti had started, he found that uh, uh, there is alienation in the Western philosophy also. Uh, it was there in Hegel, it was there in Marx, even Kant also has it. So this something, this is something very remarkable with the person Murthy, that uh, is that he take, takes Kant also as the originator of the notion of alienation in modern times, and the reason he has given is that the idea of perfection, of which Immanuel Kant talks about in his moral philosophy, the, the goodwill, uh, is something where we find that uh, alienation is there because you already have some kind of an idea which is absolutely perfect and now uh, it remains constant in and around which you have to evaluate everything else. Okay. So on alienation, one of the fundamental... Please one of the... It's a very uh, uh, late uh, session and five professors uh, have to present their papers. So I will okay. request you to sir conclude very soon. So how much um, how many how much time do you give me? 
another two minutes, three minutes? Oh, two minutes. No, two. All right, all right. So this idea of alienation, uh, which humanity has always been alienated, is the idea of the perfection. And, you know, from all historical epochs and everywhere else, he finds that humanity has always been alienated from this idea of perfection. Though Marx has taken up, you know, some other arguments, and uh, so many other things are there. So he also has gone into comprehensive account of Hegel's idea of alienation between master-slave dialectics. And I, I cannot go into the details of it. But one issue is, is something which is stuck to my mind when I was reading the book uh, in uh, Darrell Bittiville, is that uh, you know after he had discussed Hegel, so uh, what he does, uh, Professor Murthy, he discusses uh, you know Marx, and he takes up Feuerbach later on, because that way he is violating the chronology uh, of it. So most of the readers, they, you know, they have to look at it uh, that the chronology should not be violated. The notion of absolute has been, and with this I'll just finish, that the notion of absolute has been, you know, constantly preoccupied in Professor Murthy's uh, arguments and articulations. And uh, this can be understood either in the cosmological sense of the term or the psychological or theological way. And all the three streams are available in the comprehensive account of uh, philosophy. So I think I should stop. There are uh, very many philosophers who are there. I'll be there to listen to them. And if there's any question, answer in the chat bot and all. If I get opportunity, I'll address. Thank you, Professor, uh, Professor Tiwari, for giving Thank me you, this opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, we can have just one question. One real question. <laughs> it could be ideal also. Some remarks, <laughs> I, I'm making some remarks on that. Uh, Sir. If there is no question, we can invite the another speaker. And at last, you have to con give sir concluding remarks. OK, so uh, since we have five uh, speakers left uh, to be listened, so uh, I humbly request to all the next speakers to just finish your talk within 10 minutes. And then five minutes will be given to you for question answer session. So please make it as quick as you can. So next, I would like to invite Professor G.P. Das, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Bhuvaneshwar, Odisha. And he'll be speaking on Aham Brahmasmi, its logical foundation and value implication. Over to you, sir. Professor G.P. Das. Welcome, Professor Das. Uh, Professor G.P. Das, are you here, sir? So you, you have already uh, uh, listened to a very beautiful presentation by Professor R.P. R. P. Uh, Singh Ji. And Professor R.P. Singh is a widely known and very good scholar, having a very just knowledge. He has presented on uh, Murthy's philosophy. And uh, though he has not got Can much time because of starting, starting the session to okay. starting, uh, sir, starting the session. Can we invite the late. next speaker if Professor G.P. Das sir is not so, here? Uh, we will not discuss it. Rather, I will suggest that if he will send his paper, it will be published in the journal and then we will become aware of his writing on K.S. Murthy. Uh, now the second, Professor uh, G.P. Das. You are welcome, sir. Sir, I think Professor G.P. Das uh, is not here with us. So uh, without wasting any time, uh, we should invite the next speaker. So I would take an opportunity to invite Professor A.K. Rai, former professor and head department of philosophy and religion, B.H.U. Varansi. And uh, the topic of the very presentation of Professor Rai is perfection, happiness, and spirituality, an observation on a Dvaitic orientation of Acharya Ramakant Tripathi. You are most welcome, sir. Over to you now. Okay. My friend, Professor Anand Mitra, the head of the Department of Philosophy and Religion, BHU, and my friend, president of the session, Professor D.N. Tiwari, 
scholars, students, online and offline. Friends, I have to present my paper on my supervisor, Professor R.K. Tripathi. And time is allowed only 10 minutes. So what can I do? I can only give the life sketch of uh, R.K. Tripathi, something about him and something about others. And then the paper is already there. It has three parts. One part is about perfection. The ideal is perfection for Tripathi ji. The second part is the philosophical part. The third part is how can philosophy of Padvait will be beneficial to others who do not follow the philosophy of Padvait. So the paper has the three parts. Now, I have only the academic uh, relation with Professor R.K. Tripathi. And but infrequently, he talks about himself and did not much talk about himself. But one of the suggestion is, his suggestion is saying, one of the, his suggestion was that when you are criticizing others or when you are writing the comments, you should write prefix with it may be, it appears to me, not it is a wrong. So that was his suggestion whenever I am going to present my paper to him. The second is, you see, he was influenced by, though he submitted his thesis under the guidance of Professor S. Radha Krishnan, the president of India, but the real thinking bank for him was Professor T. R. B. Murthy. And he was influenced by two persons. One is, I have mentioned, Satish Chandra Mukherjee, who was living in Varanasi, who was the founder of the Dance Society. And a book was written uh, by Suprato Guha, Rastriyata or Swadeshi Andolan, 1998. It published by Suprato Guha. He was very much liked by Satish Chandu Yassi Mukherjee, who was the founder of Dance Society. And he was indirectly responsible for the establishment of the Jadapur University. So he was hiddenly living in Varanasi, and he was influencing the teachers of the Varanasi. So Tripathi ji was very close to him, and the book was written on him, uh, Yassi Mukherjee. And he has great connection. He was the class fellow of Swami Vivekananda, Asutosh Mukherjee, etc. And uh, both were Malani, Professor Malani, Professor R.K. Tripathi, and other professor, uh, a professor of mathematics, both, all these people were influenced by Yassi Mukherjee. So for this spirituality, R.K. Tripathi was influenced by Yassi Mukherjee, great Yassi Mukherjee. And for the thinking bank, he was devoted to whole and whole T.R.V. Murthy. So the philosophy of T.R.B. Murthy is incomplete without the writings of R.K. Tripathi. In nutshell, I will say, unless you read the R.K. Tripathi, because you cannot understand the just, uh, you cannot understand the T.R.B. Murthy. So both are complementary to each other. R.K. Tripathi is complementary to the study of the philosophy of T.R.B. Murthy. So very hastily, I am reading. So first point he has taken that the aim of his life is the perfection of myself and the happiness of others. What is the perfection? Perfection is yogina karma kurvanti sangam tyakpatma suddhaye. Do your duty without attachment to anything. So this is the right way to be perfect. We have to perform the duty. There are two paths, the path of renunciation and the path of action. And those who are following the path of action, they should do the act, but for the purification of the self. And that was he, in this way, he was influenced by the, but he accepts three stages. One is the natural stage, another is the moral stage, and third is the spiritual stage, a Vedantic stage, where happiness and perfection coincides in Vedanta. But in the Kantian, you say, 
God is brought to join the relation between perfection and the happiness. But that is not there. So this is the first part of the paper. Now I am going to second part. Second part is uh, we are considering the philosophy of Advait Vedan. And what is the uh, Advait Vedan in a nutshell? Satyam Brahma Jagan Mithya Jeevo Brahma Para. This is the nutshell, the philosophy of the Advait Vedan. And in order to reach the goal of the Advait Vedan, we have to negate five types of illusion. Five types of illusion we have to negate and then we can realize the self. What are the five types of, of uh, differences? The first is the difference between Ishwar, Brahman and the Jeev. So this is illusory. And in order to understand the clear-cut relation between Brahman and Jeev, we can take the example of the mirrors, gallery of mirrors, when a thing is projected differently in a plurality. So in this way, we can get rid of this type of illusion. The second is self, self uh, the second illusion is self, self is enjoyer, self is actor. How can we get rid of this confusion? We have to remember the simile of red flower near the uh, crystal. Just as the crystal is appearing red, when the red flower is put along that, similarly, the self is seems to be enjoyer and actor though it is not really actor and enjoyer so this is the second example negating the second that self we generally think that we are enjoyer and we are actor but we have to the second the third illusion is that the individual self is bounded by the body and how can we negate this we have to negate this. We have to remember the simile of the Ghatakas and Mahakas. So just as the Akas cannot be closed within the part, similarly the self cannot be closed within the parts. So by this, remembering this simile, we can negate the third part. And what is the fourth part? The word is the modification of the Brahman. That is another illusion. The word is the modification just like the uh, a seed is giving birth to a sprout. So, in order to negate this type of illusion, we have to remember that just as the gold is same, but there are ornaments, there may be ring, there may be bracelet, but gold is not going to be changing. So, by remembering this simile, we can negate this type. And lastly, we, we have to, the Brahm is the changing. Brahm is negated. Brahm and the world are both real. In order to negate this type of illusion, we have to remember the simile of rope and snake. By remembering the simile of rope and, snack, rope and snack, we can get rid of this type. So in order to realize the Advaitic reality, we have to get rid of the five types of illusions. Then we can realize the Advaitism. Now, in this chapter, I have taken examples from the uh, sciences also. I have quoted from the sciences also. I have taken Schrodinger and I have taken uh, demonstrated that how Schrodinger demonstrate that the Advait Vedanta is solving the most of the problems, epistemological problems that arise. But I will not go into Schrodinger. I will quote only one thing from the Einstein. You see, one person wrote a book, there is a no God, and sent to Einstein. Then Einstein told him that it should be titled as there is a no personal God, not there is a no God. And he, within quote, I am quoting Einstein, we followers of Spinoza see our God in the wonderful order and lawfulness of all that exists in the soul as it reveals itself in man and animal. It is a different whether belief in personal God should be contested. Friard endorsed this view in his latest publication. I myself would never engage in such a task for such a belief seems to me to lack any transcendental outlook of life. And I wonder one can ever successfully render to 
majority of mankind a more sublime means in order to satisfy its meta physical need so both schrodinger and einstein are not negating the god are transcendental god god pervading the world they are negating the personal god so the philosophy of advaita vedant has backup from the sciences also in order to demonstrate this part just as tripathi is writing tripathi is criticizing others view and that is why now i am going to the third part very actually here he has also the what is the problem what is spirituality so he says that spirituality is the method of attaining permanent peace here and there spirituality is generally defined in terms of spiritual experience but tripathi ji does not want to define spirituality in that sense how can we realize the cause of our peace is not the external circumstances not bias or sin but the pride of ego it is a ego that isolates and separates us and we have to give up the ego we see so acharya tripathi concludes that our ego is root cause of suffering it cannot be denied desire to eradicate suffering is universal yet the knowledge of root cause is not universal only only those who have the awareness of for spiritual means of tackling the ego he could be beyond suffering so we have to take care of our ego and try to be egoless try to be egoless and there is a dip, difference between spirituality and morality you see spirituality is the ornament of morality there is nothing morally wrong in helping a man in desperate condition and praising oneself before others in absence of that man but it is especially wrong to praise oneself for one's good acts and another jainism teaches us self praise is one of the cause of taking birth in sinful clan according to buddhism self praise of one's own virtue is a sign of non noble dharma one of the great virtue of lord ram is not to boast his own glory the great poet kalidas beautifully describes lakshman drops sita near the hermitage of the sel valmiki in the forest to fulfill the order of lord ram the sel the sage valmiki sheltered sita and conveyed his emotion to her i have my wrath against the elder brother of bharat ram who has acted disgracefully towards you without any cause although he pulled out thorn of three words although he is truthful result and although he is free from the self praise of his own virtues satya pratigye avikathane pi utkhat lok trayakant ke pi satya pratigye avikathane pi tvam pratya asma kalusa pravittyo aste manyu bharata grije me now what is my point there is nothing wrong morally in praising ourselves in the absence of other but spiritually it is a very condemnable that is why ram is saying satya it is the it is the quality of the ram it is the virtue of the ram that he is never praises himself sat avikathane pi so that is the difference so morality there is a difference between morality and uh, ultimately tripathi ji asks invites us that spiritual life is the egoless egolessness is spirituality egolessness is peace spirituality cannot be denied or denounced so long as there is a man in the aspiration and urge for permanent peace so if we want to attain permanent peace we cannot deny the spirituality that is the conclusion the most of the papers of acharya tripathi seems to be an exclusive devotee of advaita philosophy not bother about the contribution of other philosopher but he finds an opportunity here for the role of other philosopher along with advaita he asked us to work together for the cause of inner and outer peace to enhance the value of philosophy in the eyes of common people the role of philosophy does not depend only on the content of philosophy like the sciences it depends very much on the character of personality of a philosopher let us work ask the acharya tripathi not only to enrich the content of philosophy but also for our own inner inner and outer peace so that we become more meaningful for sustaining and transmitting the spiritual currents of different tradition to our future generation thank you all paper is over thank you so much sir
Uh, is there any question? Is there any question in the audience? No. Uh, okay, Rajan, please come. So there is a question. Please be with us. Give him the mic. Always delightful to listen to Professor A.K. Rai. Uh, sir, it is just a, a quest that when you mentioned that incident, incident that there was a letter sent to uh, Einstein regarding that there is no existence of God and Einstein denied the very fact that there is no personal God, but there is a, some different kind of God. So I just want to, and you try to balance that the scientific God and the Advaitin Brahman both are similar. So I just want the question ki jab hum kehte hain ki brahm ek the aur unhone anek hone ki ichha ki so what sort of desire is that can we compare the desire or can we bring that sort of desire in the scientific realm or that in the scientific god or can we say that scientific scientific god does not have any desire and that brahman that absolute has that sort of desire so i just want to oh. okay Okay, follow your question. Now you see, when we are eko ham bahusyam so akameyat, all these are the expression of God. But here we are talking about the absolute, not about the God. And we see Spinoza has given a new logic for the Advait Vedan. So Tripathi ji wrote his thesis, Spinoza in the light of Vedan. Spinoza in the light of Vedanta, and you see uh, and German Sanskrit Theodor Goldstucker, Spinoza religious conception and Vedanta tradition exact representation of the ideas of Vedanta. So in 19th century, the great Sanskrit of German they are of the opinion that there is a parallel similarity. Madame Blavatsky, Max Muller, all these are saying that there is a great similarity between the Spinoza. And you see, Suvakamyat means we are asking for the teleology. And Spinoza gives logic that the world is not the product of the teleology. So teleological arguments must go from the philosophy of the Dwight. You must remember when we are doing a Dwight, we are going in a window, then we have the teleology. Then we are, it is a determined by the very nature of the Brahman and very nature of the reality itself, just like the Spinoza. So Spinoza has given a different logic and for the sustaining of the spirituality of the Buddhism as well as Hinduism, that we can do philosophy without the teleology. So, so, so all these are the phenomenal statements and we have two superimposition on the absolute. And if you read the uh, Schrodinger, Schrodinger I have given, if you read the Schrodinger, he gives the example of Gauri Sankar, you just go on and he presents the uh, equation, Atman versus, so he himself, he is the better commentator, you will not find any dis dis distinction between Malani, R.K. Tripathi and Schrodinger, if you read his writing, Tattwa Masi, he has written Adkilandi Tattwa Masi, so if you read this, you see how the great science, he was awarded Nobel Prize and he was the one of the pioneer in quantum mechanics and he is writing on Advait Vedanta of Tattamasi. You must remember this. So how they appraise this and we should uh, only thanks them. Because if other tradition appreciate our tradition, then our tradition becomes more valuable, more universal and more acknowledgeable. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it so was a very. Uh, it so a it very is important. only when we are going from the coming from the Arbindo, we remember the teleology, and we are seeking teleology in Advaita Vedanta and Buddhism, and that is the create that creates the problem. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, we have with us uh, Professor S. Paneer Selvam, former professor, Department of Philosophy, University of Madras, Chennai, Tamil Nadu. So, without further ado, I'm handing over the mic to you, sir. Please deliver your lecture. Professor Paneer Selvam.
सर प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ ओके रेस्पेक्टेड प्रोफेसर तिवारी जी प्रोफेसर आर पी सिंह एंड फ्रेंड्स हु आर प्रेजेंट इन बी एच यू एंड फ्रेंड्स हु आर ऑनलाइन एंड माई डी एस स्टूडेंट्स at the outset i am grateful to professor uh, anand mishra ji for giving me this nice opportunity of sharing my uh, views with regard to interpretation of advaita in the contemporary philosophical discourse here i would like to talk about one important uh, contemporary thinker uh, who has contributed uh, substantially uh, in contemporary philosophy uh, in the context of advaita vedanta now prior to that i would like to state that uh, many of our contemporary philosophers have given a new methodology for understanding our own tradition uh, using the linguistic model the phenomenological model and comparative model and uh, by using these models we are able to understand uh, uh, indian philosophical tradition especially advaita uh, in a beautiful way Uh, not only advaita but other systems of philosophy also of course uh, for example subhijivan bhattacharya's usage of uh, mathematical logic to represent uh, navyanaya then bk mathilal's uh, uh, understanding usage of analytical philosophy to understand nyaya realism then jn mohanty's uh, application of husserlian concept uh, of phenomenology to indian philosophical problems and ganeshwar mishra's uh, methodology of understanding the linguistic philosophy in advaita vedanta then our balasubramanian's uh, methodology of using phenomenological model for understanding advaita vedanta these are some of the uh, well known methods which are very much available in contemporary philosophical discourse but i would like to introduce to you uh, one important thinker uh, his name is uh, ramakrishna puligandla perhaps uh, some of you might be aware of this name and if my professor my good friend uh, uh, godavari mishra is there he would uh, uh, also accept that puligandla is a very important philosopher of uh, the century who has seen uh, advaita from the analytical tradition and uh, he has made uh, uh, analytical as well as uh, the phenomenological model in order to understand advaita uh, tradition from a new perspective i would like to call his uh, method of methodology as a comparative uh, and analytical comparative hyphen analytical methodology without deviating from the tradition to interpret shankara in the contemporary understanding and this method uh, that is the comparative analytic method has certain advantages for example it has not reduced everything to analysis and hence uh, the fallacy of reductionism is completely avoided and secondly this method of uh, ramakrishna puligandla allows us to think and apply the western methodology to indian philosophical problems to ponder over the question why very similar puzzles evoke uh, different responses from different people as uh, suggested by professor bk mathilal now ramakrishna puligandla's uh, scholarship uh, is well known in indian philosophy because he has used uh, the western methodology or the western background in order to show the novelty uh, which is very much present in advaita vedanta for example puligandla applies uh, of course puligandla is from uh, uh, andhra andhra pradesh and later he settled in us but he is a uh, well known uh, uh, phenomenologist he is well aware of uh, the advaita vedanta and also he is very much familiar with uh, uh, modern logic and uh, philosophy of science Uh, so what he did was he applied the big bang theory and uh, derrida's deconstruction and the western philosophy of language to understand uh, advaita vedanta and i would like to mention two of his very important uh, papers published in madras university that one is uh, consciousness and the world in advaita vedanta uh, here he looks at the doctrine of uh, adhyasa from the analytical standpoint and also another important uh, paper of uh, professor puligandla is uh, an analytical interpretation of advaita vedanta and there is also another important paper immanence and transcendence in the upanishadic teaching 
in all these papers he could uh, successfully give the analytical uh, as well as the phenomenological understanding of advaita vedanta that uh, actually makes him uh, something unique in the field of or in the in the uh, in the in the uh, advaitic tradition now a phenomenon he defines uh, what is a phenomenon he says a phenomenon is anything that is or can in principle be an object of consciousness that is he is trying to develop a phenomenological method so he tries to define what a phenomenon is that is how a phenomenon is always connected to object of consciousness so he says every phenomenon can be assigned either both spatial and temporal and it coordinates with the, the temporal world so this means what Uh, according to Pulligan's lies, what exists in time and uh, which is bounded by time is something related to consciousness. And Brahman cannot be a phenomenon because uh, it transcends everything. Of course, there are many uh, uh, phenomenologists, Indian phenomenology like uh, Jain Mohanty and R. Balasubramaniam, who have made some attempt in this direction. But what makes Pulligan uh, unique is that he shows a uh, the major distinction that exists between brahman on the one side and the object of consciousness or the empirical world where he argued that brahman cannot be a phenomenon because it transcends everything so he says brahman as a pure uh, uh, and objectless consciousness whereas jiva is an object of consciousness and not consciousness itself here lies the major uh, distinction because uh, when he defines uh, uh, or when he interprets brahman by saying that it is objectless consciousness he shows how it transcends uh, the ordinary understanding of consciousness which often quite often uh, is applied to uh, uh, empirical things so according to to puligandla atman is uh, pure and consciousness itself it is objectless uh, and consciousness so brahman according to him is immanent in this sense and uh, all existence and multiplicity are the manifestations of brahman similarly he says brahman is transcendent in the sense that uh, brahman either as a power whose manifestation or the world of phenomena or as pure objectless consciousness cannot in principle be experienced as a phenomenon or, or object of consciousness so it is very clear from his approach that in the experience of brahman as transcendent there is always objectless consciousness and the knower known distinction is transcendent or it is absent now what he uh, is trying to argue is that all phenomena except uh, uh, without exception are reducible to brahman which is not itself a phenomenon this is a major uh, distinction he shows uh, between Uh, uh, brahman and other entities so according to the Bra- according to puligandla brahman is unmanifest pure object like consciousness is experienceable when one eliminates all mental modification so he is very right in saying that uh, in the experience of brahman as transcendent there cannot be any distinction among the knower known and the act of uh, knowing these distinctions belong belong to the domain of dualistic ways of uh, knowing but not in the experience of brahman where the dualistic understanding is completely absent now keeping this as a backdrop he would uh, uh, tell us that how the consciousness which is identical to brahman is formless and nameless and he says when everything that can be thought away is thought away what remains is pure objectless consciousness the ultimate residue now by developing this uh, phenomenological method or by seeing the phenomenological method in advaita he is trying to argue that this method is quite different from that of uh, husserl and sar because uh, he says uh, for husserl and sar consciousness is always uh, intentional and that is what is called the object consciousness of something now the question that uh, can be raised here is this whether consciousness can be non intentional this is a very important question according to pligandla whether consciousness can be non intentional since consciousness cannot be empty 
it must always be relational and hence intentional. So bare consciousness, uh, which is devoid of uh, objects, is unimaginable. So this means Puligindla's methodology, though, is remarkable, uh, like that of uh, the method developed by uh, Professor uh, R. Balasubramaniam and others. I would always uh, see that there is uh, a, a problem that is always pricking in the methodology which he has uh, used in order to interpret. I mean, he, the methodology which he has used in order to interpret Advaita Vedanta by focusing on the phenomenology. Why? Because my my contention is the question is this: whether consciousness can be non-intentional, since uh, consciousness cannot be empty. It must be always relational and hence intentional. So bare consciousness, sorry right? To interrupt you, devoid sir. of objects. Yeah. So sorry Hello? to interrupt. Please, please conclude, sir. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Bare consciousness, which is devoid of objects, is uh, unimaginable. So this uh, two relation, that is, uh, in quote, two relation, that is how objects are always in relation to uh, how consciousness is always in relation to something. Some objects or other is a uh, little problematic if we apply the Advaitic methodology. On the other hand, if we use uh, the methodology which is de developed by Ramanuja, it is very clear that Ramanuja's uh, position is quite acceptable for the main reason that Ramanuja is the one who speaks about uh, that consciousness is always uh, uh, relational. Of course, there are Indian scholars like Professor R. Balasubramanian who argue. That the Advaitins have transcended the methodology of uh, the phenomenology developed by Usual and others, but how far that is true is uh, uh, is uh, quite uh, doubtful. And uh, the, one, with one more point, I stop. The uh, methodology which Puligendra uh, has adopted is something no doubt is remarkable. For example, he tries to deconstruct Advaita Vedanta because all of us know that deconstruction has been uh, playing very important role in the Western. Uh, uh, methodology, especially Derrida's uh, uh, application of a deconstructive method to philosophical discourse, is something remarkable. And uh, he talks about uh, uh, Ramakrishna Puligendra talks about a uh, uh, super de superimposition. This is uh, the phrase which he uses, and he says uh, the methodology with uh, which uh, the Advaitins used is quite different from that of uh, uh, um, from that of uh, Derrida's deconstruction. And here he says that uh, this methodology de developed by uh, Indian philosophers is something uh, which uh, transcends uh, the methodology of uh, uh, Derrida. So he shows by quoting uh, uh, Harold Coward, who has written a very beautiful book on uh, Derrida's deconstruction and Indian philosophy. Puligan uh, Law argues that uh, our methodology, that is Indian methodology, would easily transcend. Uh, or it, it avoids some of the difficulties which arise in the context of uh, the Western deconstructive method developed by uh, uh, Derrida and others. So I'll conclude by saying the methodology which uh, we find in contemporary Indian philosophers' approach, like Puligandla and others, is something really remarkable for the main reason that they could successfully use the Western methodology in order to show that Advaitic tradition is not alien to some of the methods which uh, we have developed. So there, though there are certain difficulties in accepting Puligandla's uh, position fully, he has given a new insight, like Professor R. Balasubramaniam. And uh, that insight has to be taken seriously in order to show that how Advaita could uh, transcend the Western phenomenological method or the Western deconstructive approach, which uh, we have been talking about in. Uh, Western philosophical discourse. So this is my position that I would like to say that uh, some of the methods which you have developed in uh, Western tradition, like phenomenology, linguistic, or hermeneutics, or postmodern tradition, can be seen in Indian tradition also. It is not something new to us. It is not something alien to us. The thing is, you must uh, know how to look at the Indian tradition so that the beauty of Indian tradition could be seen. With this, I would like to uh, conclude, and I thank you very much for this wonderful thank opportunity. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Thank you so very much. And uh, now this paper is before you for interaction. If there is any question, please make it quick. Is there anyone who is willing to ask any question? 
no sorry there is none so uh, we are heading forward and the next speaker with us is dr k vengat chalam assistant professor department of philosophy madras christian college chennai tamil nadu and he'll be speaking on human unity and its necessity in post independence india a neo vedantin appraisal over to you now sir yes thank you ma'am am i audible yes you are please go yeah. on yes thank you ma'am yes uh, a very good evening to all uh, uh, the title which i have chosen for this seminar is human unity and its necessity in post independence india a neo vedantin appraisal myself dr k venkatacharan assistant professor from madras christian college chennai tamil nadu a neo vedantin appraisal whom i have chosen for this presentation is none other than uh, a well known personality she arbindo so as far as arbindo's uh, vision is concerned i'm going to explain what are all the pos- issues and the possibility of uh, solving the uh, social issue which we are facing from the uh, independence or post independence even to, till today the one major issue which we could, we could find here is unifying the human so unifying the human possibly have been attempted even from post uh, independence socially politically and culturally if you trace the question of what is the need for the human unity uh, sri arvindo addresses it uh, the idea of unification of human is uh, possibly happens because of the natural thirst where a nature has its own law based on that law it possibly giving an instinct in the human for in search of unifying ourselves so because of this natural law of because of this instinct in human we are trying to attempt in all possible way socially politically and culturally in trying to unify ourselves but uh, if you trace the possibility or the issue or the challenges she arbindo will address or whatever we have been trying to attempt here is only partial in nature or from his technical term we can say it addresses only the superficial of the life uh, more specifically he says the cultural social and the religious factors which attempts to unify the humans or only addressing at the surfaces of the life why he addresses in such a way that these factors are attempting only the surfaces of life because uh, this need to be understood from sri arbindo's analysis of human nature if you analyze the human nature uh, presented by sri arbindo you will find human is neither material substance nor a spiritual substance or there is a uh, integral substance uh, this could be traced from the well known uh, cosmological theory of sri arbindo where the whole existence is uh, uh, is from the absolute which descends into matter which we call is an involution process then it uh, evolves to life mind and further hierarchy of minds and then it reaches back to the absolute in tracing this i'm just uh, run, uh, 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 running this because uh, time is lagging so this whole evolution process you will find you can trace human is somewhere which is from the absolute and evolved from the material substance and this material substance as far as this here even though is concerned not the uh, not the uh, unconscious substance but it is the substance which is inconscient it has the spiritual aspect which is dormant silent in state so when the evolution of the human is from presupposes from the material substance and somewhere in the evolution process we can see we have reached at the state of mental state starting from the material life psyche so now he says the the reason why i have said the uh, unification of human is the natural instinct because of she are be those cosmological thing you can see the whole map where nature itself has an attempt for an human unification why because as far as the his cosmological theory is concerned there is a need for an integrality to go, to go back to its original form or the uh, what we mean by the unified form or the integral form where we are in the multiple personalities so 
uh, one possible way of attempting here, as I said earlier, is there is an ideal of uh, uh, social ideal where two seconds. So, 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 sorry. There is a social ideal where there is a uh, there is a state idea where a group or a community with its own power and the legal authorities are trying to fulfill this unification. But uh, when we address the human aggregates, one, it has an individual fulfilling which is lacking for perfection. And otherwise, it is an collective, which we call it as a social aggregate, which need to be fulfilled. This social ideal or the uh, social, political, and cultural uh, uh, attempts which we have been doing from post-independence, we could say it only satisfied the collective aggregates, the social aggregates. It fails to come into depth with the individual aggregates where, yes, uh, where it fails to fulfill the individual aggregate. So the state idea which have been attempted since post-independence, uh, we could find theoretically it has a major aim of addressing common good of human. But practically speaking, it is somehow less satisfying the surface part of the life, human external life, which is more mechanical and machinery. Rather, it fails to understand the inherent nature of human. So, uh, Sri Aurobindo, from this story, Sri Aurobindo's technical term, I can say the whole attempt. This is if you trace the uh, human uh, evolution. These are all the various attempt of unification. Theoretically, where this collective egoism is attempted at the surface level, but whereas the Arbindo is insisting on the sacred egoism. Only when there is a possibility of uh, these are all the uh, uh, these are all the uh, uh, various uh, 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 analysis between human and the social, individual and the collective uh, analysis, where human is trying to uh, search for something based on the perfection and the harmony, whereas the nation is trying to fulfill something else. The need, according to Sri Aurobindo, emphasizing here, based on the human unity, is it is not just a mechanized moral humanity. Rather, it, there is a need for a spiritualist human unity. So as far as the whole theory is concerned, I'm trying to make a critical uh, estimate here. Uh, the possibility of human unity is the destiny. And the destiny will happen as far as the natural law is concerned. But as far as the uh, uh, possibility of uh, political power, what we call it as a state idea, the ideal of state in possibility in attempting the unity is always fulfilling only the external limbs, but not that the internal limbs. The internal here, what we call it as analyzing the individual with the real spirit which it always tries to the fulfillment of collectivism, which will necessarily happen. So this is how I conclude my paper. Uh, if there is any further question, uh, uh, let me clarify it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Vengadachulam. And is there any question from the audience, online as well as offline? Uh, no. Okay, sorry, uh, we have no question for you, sir. So we are moving forward. And the last, but certainly not the least, uh, the the speaker is Dr. Digvijay Mishra, Assistant Professor on Guest Basis in the Department of Philosophy and Culture, Mahatma Gandhi, Antarashtra, Hindi Vishwavidyale, Vardha, Maharashtra. And the very topic of his presentation is Bharatiya Gyan Pranali, Advait Vedant Ke Vishesh Sandarb Mein. So over to you now, Dr. Digvijay Mishra. Uh, थैंक यू मैम इस सत्र की अध्यक्षता कर रहे आदरणीय तिवारी सर को प्रणाम विभाग के विभागाध्यक्ष सर को आभासी पटल पर प्रोफेसर एक सर को प्रणाम और सेमिनार हाल में सेमिनार हाल में सेमिनार हाल में उपस्थित सभी गुरुजनों को और आभासी पटल में उपस्थित सभी गुरुजनों को प्रणाम मैं दिग्विजय मिश्र अतीत अध्यापक दर्शन एवं संस्कृति विभाग महात्मा गांधी अंतरराष्ट्रीय हिंदी विश्वविद्यालय वर्धा विद्याम च अविद्याम च यस्तद वेदो उभयम स अविद्या मृत्युम तृप्तवा विद्या अमृतम स्मृति मेरे आलेख का विषय है भारतीय ज्ञान प्रणाली अद्वैत वेदांत के विशेष संदर्भ में 
भारतीय ज्ञान प्रणाली का उद्भव वेदों से स्वीकार किया जाता है तथा वेदों का यह ज्ञान पुंज वैदिक काल से लेकर अब तक बराबर अपने प्रकाश से न केवल भारत को अपितु विश्व के अनेक उन राष्ट्रों को भी मार्गदर्शन देता आ रहा है जो जाने अनजाने इसका अनुसरण कर रहे हैं इस ज्ञान राशि को न सिर्फ भारत बल्कि संपूर्ण विश्व सबसे प्राचीन ज्ञान स्रोत के रूप में स्वीकार करता है भारतीय दर्शन समाज और साहित्य में तो वेद का इतना प्रभाव पड़ा कि वेद का तात्पर्य ज्ञान से लिया जाने लगा अतः यह कहा जा सकता है कि भारतीय ज्ञान प्रणाली की चर्चा बिना वेद के अधूरी रह जाएगी इस बात को ऐसे भी समझा जा सकता है कि वेद ही वह प्रमुख आधार है जो भारतीय दर्शन की दिशा और दशा बहुत हद तक तय करता है वेद वाक्य एकम सत विपरा बहुदा बदंती का तात्पर्य यही है कि सत तो एक ही है किंतु विद्वान लोग उसकी अलग अलग प्रकार से व्याख्या करते हैं यह वेद वाक्य कहीं ना कहीं सभी की मूल उत्पत्ति का कारण किसी एक ही सत्ता को स्वीकार करता है और ऐसा करते हुए यह हमारा ध्यान इस ओर आकृष्ट कराता है कि हमें जो भेद अथवा नाना तो दिख रहा है उसका तात्विक कारण कोई एक ही सत्ता हो सकती है इस तरह से इस तरह से यह वेद वाक्य भारतीय दार्शनिक परंपरा को एक सूत्र में पिरोने का भी काम करता है इसलिए हम स्वीकार करते हैं कि भारतीय ज्ञान प्रणाली और दार्शनिक प्रणाली का विकास खंड खंड में ना हो करके एक सतत प्रवाह के रूप में चला आ रहा है जिसका सातत्य वैदिक काल से लेकर आज तक देखा जा सकता है किंतु कुछ विद्वानों का ऐसा आग्रह रहता है कि वैदिक परंपरा से नितांत भिन्न एक दूसरी परंपरा भी रही है जिसके अंतर्गत श्रमण परंपरा जैन परंपरा और और बौद्ध परंपरा को स्वीकार किया जाता है हालांकि जो लोग एक परंपरा वैदिक परंपरा को ही स्वीकार करते हैं वे श्रमण परंपरा और बहुत परंपरा को वैदिक परंपरा से नितांत भिन्न नहीं समझते हैं क्योंकि वेदों में हमें उन सभी विचारों के संकेत उपलब्ध होते हैं अथवा उन्हें खोजा जा सकता है जितने दार्शनिक संप्रदाय हम वर्तमान समय में देख रहे हैं यह संभवतः निर्विवाद ही है हाँ विवाद इस हाँ विवाद इस पक्ष को लेकर अवश्य हो सकता है कि वेदों में किस तरह के विचारों का बाहुल्य है अथवा वेदों का तात्पर्य क्या है यह एक दूसरा विषय है किंतु जो लोग संपूर्ण विचारों का उद्गम स्थल एक से ही स्वीकार करते हैं उनका तो यही मानना है कि यह सब अलग अलग व्याख्याएं हमें केवल बोध तत्व साक्षात्कार कराने के लिए हैं तथा वे परस्पर विरुद्ध दिख रही हैं किंतु वास्तव में ऐसा है नहीं उपरोक्त में जिस वेद की चर्चा की गई है तथा यह भी दिखाया गया है कि यह रा, यह ज्ञान राशि भारतीय ज्ञान प्रणाली और परंपरा का द्योतक है उसी वेद के अंतिम भाग अर्थात उपनिषद भाग को वेदांत कहते हैं प्रसिद्ध भी है कि वेद से अंत वेदांत यहाँ यदि हम वेद को ज्ञान के अर्थ में ले तो वेद तो वेदांत का तात्पर्य कहीं ना कहीं अत्यंतिक ज्ञान अल्टीमेट नॉलेज से होगा इससे हमारे मस्तिष्क में अनायासी यह प्रश्न उठता है कि क्या ज्ञान भी आत्यांतिक और अना अनात्यांतिक हो सकता है इस प्रश्न के उत्तर में कहा जा सकता है हाँ ऐसा हो सकता है क्योंकि जो अनात्यांतिक ज्ञान है उसका अन्य प्रकार के ज्ञानों से निश्चित ही विरोध हो सकता है जबकि आत्यांतिक ज्ञान आत्यांतिक ज्ञान की तो अनिवार्यता ही यह है कि उसका अन्य किसी भी प्रकार के ज्ञान से कोई भी विरोध नहीं होगा अपितु तो वह तो सर्व समावेशी होगा भारतीय ज्ञान प्रणाली में हमें अद्वैत वेदांत और माध्यमिक दर्शन में यह आत्यांतिकता देखने को मिलती है बहरहाल यदि व्यवहारिक ज्ञान की बात की जाए तो शंकराचार्य इस बात को स्वीकार करते हैं कि व्यवहार में अद्वैत वेदांत भाट मत को स्वीकार करता है और शंकराचार्य ऐसा कहते हैं तो उनके इस कथन के आधार पर विद्वत समाज इसे भी सहर्ष स्वीकार करेगा कि व्यवहार के लिए ही व्यवहार के लिए वेदांत दर्शन तो न्याय सम्मत चार प्रमाण को भी उसी तरह स्वीकार करेगा ठीक इसी तरह की बात चंद कीर्ति प्रसन्न पदा में करते हुए नजर आते हैं जब वे कहते हैं कि दो प्रमाण प्रत्यक्ष और अनुमान ही क्यों हमें तो न्याय सम्मत चार प्रमाण भी स्वीकार रहे हैं इसमें कोई आपत्ति नहीं है उपरोक्त विवेचना से स्पष्ट है कि ज्ञान आत्यांतिक और अनात्यांतिक दो प्रकार का होता है तथा आत्यांतिक ज्ञान का यह वैशिष्ट है कि उसका किसी भी प्रकार से अन्य ज्ञान से कोई विरोध नहीं होगा अब हम संक्षेप में विद्याओं की चर्चा करते हैं विष्णु पुराण में अठारह प्रकार की विद्याओं की चर्चा की गई है जिसमें छह वेदांग है चार वेद है मीमांसा न्याय पुराण धर्म शास्त्र आयुर्वेद धनुर्वेद गंधर्व अस्त्र अर्थशास्त्र इसके अलावा भारतीय विद्युत आचार्य विद्या के चार विभाग और बताते हैं अनविक्षिकी त्रयी वार्ता और दंड नीति अब एक प्रश्न उठता है कि व्यवहार के ज्ञान के लिए यही प्रमुख प्रश्न है इस आलेख का अब यह प्रश्न उठता है कि व्यवहार के ज्ञान के लिए प्रमाण शास्त्र है तथा प्रमा परमार्थ के ज्ञान के लिए प्रमाण अनुपयोगी है तो जो व्यवहार और परमार्थ की प्रणाली है उसके बीच विरोध है अथवा नहीं यदि विरोध नहीं है तो दोनों प्रकार के ज्ञान समकक्ष अथवा एक कोटि के हो जाएंगे और यदि दोनों में विरोध है तो दोनों पर 
दोनों में से कोई एक ही स्वीकार होगा किंतु अद्वैत वेदांत में दोनों ज्ञान प्रणालियों को स्वीकृत किया गया है तब यह प्रश्न उठता है कि अद्वितियों द्वारा ऐसा किए जाने का आधार क्या है तथा वे इसको किस प्रकार से कर पाते हैं दूसरे शब्दों में कहें तो मनुष्य की पूर्णता का तात्पर्य यह है कि वह व्यवहार और परमार्थ दोनों को ही प्राप्त करे यदि वह इन दोनों में से किसी एक को प्राप्त करता है दूसरे को नहीं तो निश्चित रूप से उसे पूर्ण नहीं कहा जा सकता यथा भौतिकवादी केवल व्यवहार को ही सत्य मान मानकर चलता है तथा परमार्थ का अपलाप करता है और तथा कथित आध्यात्मिक लोग केवल परमार्थ को ही सत्य मानते हैं तथा व्यवहार का अपलाप करते हैं इस तरह यह दोनों ही जीवन के केवल एक पक्ष को महत्व देते हैं तथा दूसरे को नकार देते हैं जो कि मनुष्यता की पूर्णता अथवा समग्रता का परिचायक नहीं है किंतु उपनिषदों और आदि गुरु शंकराचार्य ने हमारा ध्यान ऐसे ज्ञान प्रणाली की ओर आकृष्ट कराया है जिससे व्यवहार व्यवहार और परमार्थ दोनों को प्राप्त किया जा सकता है इसकी चर्चा श्री अरविंद भी करते हैं यही कारण है कि नव वेदांती स्वामी विवेकानंद भी हमारा ध्यान उस ओर आकृष्ट कराते हुए वेदांत को सार्वभौम धर्म बनाने की अनुशंसा करते हैं और लोगों के मन में यह बात ना रहे कि वेदांत दर्शन व्यवहार को नकारता है इसलिए उन्होंने व्यवहारिक वेदांत की चर्चा की है वह ज्ञान प्रणाली जिससे व्यवहार और परमार्थ दोनों को प्राप्त किया जाता है उस और ईसा वासु उपनिषद हमारा संकेत करता है ईसा वासु उपनिषद का एक मंत्र है विद्याम च अविद्याम च यस्तो उभ्याम सह अविद्या मृत्यु तीर्थवा विद्या अमृत मसूते अर्थात जो विद्या और अविद्या इन दोनों को एक साथ जानता है वो अविद्या से मृत्यु को पार कर करके वह अविद्या से मृत्यु को प्राप्त पार करके विद्या से अमृत को प्राप्त होता है अब प्रश्न उठता है कि विद्या और अविद्या क्या है तो इसके उत्तर में मुंडुको उपनिषद कहता है कि विद्या दो प्रकार की होती है अपराविद्या और पराविद्या ये जितने भी ऋग्वेद साम वेद यजुर्वेद शिक्षा कल्प व्याकरण ये जितने भी है ये सब अपराविद्या है इनको ही शंकराचार्य अपने भाष्य में कहते हैं कि अपरा विद्या ही अविद्या है और परा विद्या एकमात्र ब्रह्म का साक्षात्कार है जैसा कि बार बार लोगों ने कहा ब्रह्मविद ब्रह्मे वो भवती इसके आगे मैंने दिखाया है कि इसमें जो है अद्वैत अद्वैत दर्शन में ज्ञान प्रणाली के तीन भाग हो सकते हैं पहला ब्रह्मात्मक ज्ञान का निरूपण दूसरा व्यवहारिक ज्ञान का निरूपण और तीसरा पारमार्थिक ज्ञान का निरूपण ब्रह्मात्मक ज्ञान के निरूपण में वही अनिर्वचनीय ख्याति जो आती है आप सभी परिचित हैं फिर व्यवहारिक ज्ञान के निरूपण में वेदांत परिभाषाकार जिन छह परमाणु की चर्चा करते हैं उनकी चर्चा की गई है और उसके बाद पारमार्थिक ज्ञान का निरूपण इस पे थोड़ा बोलना चाहेंगे परमार्थिक ज्ञान का निरूपण जिसका हमको वेदांत सार में दिखता है जहां पे पारमार्थिक ज्ञान के निरूपण में कहा गया है कि वेदांत में अध्यारोप और अपवाद की चर्चा की गई है अध्याप अध्यारोप को परिभाषित करते हुए कहा गया है जो सर्प नहीं है उस रज्जु में सर्प के आरोप की भांति वस्तु में अवस्तु का आरोप ही अध्यारोप है तब प्रश्न उठता है कि वेदांत दर्शन में वस्तु और अवस्तु क्या है तो इसके उत्तर में कहा जाता है कि सच्चिदानंद अनंत अद्वय ब्रह्म ही वस्तु है तथा अज्ञान आदि समग्र जड़ वस्तु जड़ जड़ समूह अवस्तु है अपवाद क्या है तो अपवाद को परिभाषित करते हुए कहा जाता है जो अवस्तु भूत है उसका वस्तु के रूप में उपदेश करना ही अपवाद है जिस प्रकार घट मिट्टी से अलग नहीं हता नहीं है मिट्टी ही है उसी प्रकार जिस क्रम की जिस क्रम से उत्पत्ति बताई गई है उसी क्रम से कार्य को कारण के रूप में समझना कार्य की सत्ता को कारण की सत्ता से अतिरिक्त नहीं समझना ही अपवाद है इस प्रकार की बात शंकराचार्य ब्रह्म सूत्र के भाष में भी करते हुए देखे जाते हैं जहां वो लौकिक उदाहरण देते हुए कहते हैं कि जिस क्रम से सीढ़ी पर ऊपर चढ़ा जाता है उसी क्रम से नीचे उतरा जाता है अब मैं इस पेपर को खत्म करते हुए बताता हूँ एक मिनट में इस तरह अध्यारोप और अपवाद के द्वारा जब शिष्य को ज्ञान होता है तो अध्यारोप अपवाद के माध्यम से जब यह बता दिया जाता है कि एकमात्र ब्रह्म ही तत्व है उसके अतिरिक्त जो कुछ भी भाषमान है वह सब कुछ उस ब्रह्म में अध्यस्त है तो उस अध्यारोप और अपवाद के द्वारा तत्व मसीह वह तुम हो इस वाक्य के घटक तत्पद और तोम पद का क्या अर्थ है इसका शोधन भी हो जाता है इस प्रकार देखा जा सकता है कि व्यवहार और परमार्थ इन दोनों की प्राप्ति अद्वैत वेदांत के द्वारा बताई गई ज्ञान प्रणाली से हो जाती है क्योंकि वेद को भारतीय ज्ञान राशि के रूप में स्वीकार किया जाता है और उस वेद के अंतिम भाग अर्थात तो उपनिषद भाग को वेदांत कहते हैं जिसके द्वारा व्यवहार और परमार्थ इन दोनों को प्राप्त किया जा सकता है अतः इस अर्थ में कहा जा सकता है कि जितने बेहतर ढंग से भारतीय ज्ञान प्रणाली को अद्वैत वेदांत प्रस्तुत करता है उतने बेहतर ढंग से अन्य दर्शन नहीं 
प्रोफेसर टी आर बी मूर्ति भी अपनी पुस्तक द सेंट्रल फिलोसफी ऑफ बुद्धिज्म में कहते हैं कि औपनिस्तिक परंपरा के विकास को देखते हुए यह कहा जा सकता है कि यद्यपि समस्त ब्राह्मण प्रस्थान उपनिषद से उद्भूत हैं तथापि यह स्वीकार करने में तार्किक संगति है कि केवल अद्वैत वेदांत ही उपनिषदों के मर्म तक पहुंचता है इस आधार पर यह कहा जा सकता है कि अद्वैत वेदांत भारतीय ज्ञान प्रणाली की व्याख्या करने में सफल है थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच इज देर एनी क्वेश्चन वी कैन टेक अप वन क्वेश्चन इफ एनी नो ओके so we are already running late without any further ado i am inviting professor uh, dn tiwari sir for the presidential remark please come sir thank you professor niti singh ji respected professor anand misra head of the department of philosophy professor rc pradhan Professor Dilip Man and Professor Hat, many scholars in the audience. Professor Ambika Dutt Sharma ji and research scholars. Really, you know. i'm not going to present a parallel speech i will take only 5 minutes and this 5 minutes for justifying myself for doing unjust injustice with the distinguished scholars who presented their paper in 5 and 10 minutes you know these are philosophers of the Present time, Professor uh, Panir Selvam, Professor uh, R K Rai, Professor R P Singh Ji, and uh, others. So you know, it is always amusing to listen them for hours and hours. And if such a situation arises because of the paucity of time that they have been given uh, only to introduce their paper. that is not justice on the part of them however what they presented they give some new points that tells you about the contemporary development in the advaitic tradition professor rp singh presented his paper on immanence and transcendence in ks murthy so earlier i was knowing that ks murthy in his advaita vedant has uh, inserted the trinity of christianity and all that but i found that uh, rp singh by his discussion but but a very introductory discussion hmm testified him that the transcendent and immanent as presented in indian philosophy and in indian western philosophy ah uh, uh is the same have the same sense that uh are that that uh, ks murthy has so he might have concluded well but i we could not uh, provide time to him second speaker professor ekera i speak about the advait especially his guru his teacher professor r k tripathi's philosophy of advait really i have also been the student of professor uh, r k tripathi uh, and has written his work spinoza and advait vedanta it was very popular at a time <clears throat> people used to come to our department to ask about his book from the foreign countries but now it is not available in the market why so i i can't say but over three points professor uh, he has done a very hindi commentary on chatur sutri on brahma sutra and written so many papers on spirituality freedom suffering ah 
So the collection is also not published so far by this big department. <clears throat> that should be taken up. That should be published. Huh? So many papers she has written, very scholarly papers. So the contemporary Advait by R.K. Tripathi, what, what he added, Professor Raya says that we do not criticize anybody directly. We do not we, we, we do not charge anybody directly. But we can say maybe this way, maybe huh? not like that, the that is. So you see the beauty of the so you cannot say that the world is world is false. You can you may say that maybe that the world is false. So other point he made that uh, about Schroeder Advait Vedant presentation. So he wanted to give so many things about the Professor Arkatri Party's contribution to Advait Vedanta. But he only gives few points on on spirituality, on, on, on perfection and spirituality. So, you know, sometimes perfection and spirituality, they conflict. Perfection is ideal. So, it is a determination. It can determine you. This is only the perfect idea, perfect way to do that thing. And if you are perfect in something, you may not be perfect in other things. And very difficult to be a Socrates uh, and to follow the pathway of the animal. Very difficult. So he may be a perfect man, a perfect uh, philosopher, but he may not be a perfect man. So perfection always contradicts, but his spirituality opens. It opens the knots the problems of our mind and makes our mind free. So the midway by interpreting the action, Professor R. A. K. Rai beautifully shown the how Professor Tripathi introduced egolessness in doing. That is the Gita way. So if you are egoless, you are your path is to spirituality. But the thing is that the spirituality is not decided by only uh, Egolessness. You may be egoless because you won't have any spark in your mind. Huh? You won't have any ego. This may also be possible. But if you have some spark and then you are ego, egoless, that counts. So, what counts for the spirituality is to do everything egolessly. But there is a mission that whatever you do, you do for the welfare. So, Professor. I am thankful to uh, Professor Ekerai also. The young, uh, the Panir Selvam Shah, a very good orator, very good philosopher, and uh, expert in contemporary philosophy. He has got expertise at that time. So he was presenting the Orissa, Ut Orissa Utkal, Utkal tradition of, uh, in uh, tradition of. Uh, interpreting the Advaita Vedanta, and he quoted so many philosoph contemporary philosophers, uh, uh, especially Ganeshwar Mishra. And really, I have uh, I have listened, I have I have read Ganeshwar Mishra's writings, and he has added so many ways the methodology of how perceiving uh, the Advaita Vedanta. And Professor Panir Selvam very beautiful quoted that we are more than uh, relevant still in the field of the method. Ah, and that was the uh, high, that was highlighted and made the con uh, contemporary world West uh, aware about the uh, deconstructing method following in the Advait, ah, by the interpretation of the Advait. So the young scholars, one is Bengata Chalam. He also presented a very good paper, but his paper was more 
sociological and management type. Ah, but he raised a very good question. Unity and necessity. So we were hearing necessity for unity, but his topic was unity and necessity. So he was willing to give something for the unity, for the Samanwe, as Professor uh, Arishankar Prasadji remarked uh, while Professor R.C. Pradhani was sharing. So I, I think that his paper was intending to say this, so. And the last one is uh, Dr. Dig Vijay Misraji, he's a young philosopher and he is very enthusiastic. But I think that uh, he has failed to give his conclusion. And uh, next time, if time permits only two minutes or three minutes, he has to present his conclusion first. So this is with this suggestion. Uh, uh, I am. Uh, I, I thank uh, uh, to the team. Uh, of the department and especially to uh, Niti Singh Ji and to the chair, to the head of the department, Professor Anand Misra, for organizing such a seminar, which I was waiting uh, since long, that there must be a seminar on uh, post advaitic uh, ad uh, post uh, uh, independence Advait. And very happy to find here Amika Dajji and uh, uh, Professor Bhatt and Professor Arshi Pradhan among the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks to all the participants. And now, uh, with the permission of the chair, I'm announcing the end of the program here, but you are all invited for Haiti now. Thanks, one and all. <laughs>